Um, good morning, everyone. I hope it's not too early. Um, we have our first speaker of the day. Uh, this is the third and last day of DAPCON. And please give a round of applause to Thomas von bon Baumhardt from Argent. Okay, well, so yeah, welcome everyone uh, to my talk, um, bringing the best of Web 2, UX and security to Web 3. And I mean, why is this interesting? I mean, obviously there are billions of users in Web 2. If we um, take a few of the UX concepts there and also security, it's more familiar to them and then easier to onboard more users into the Web 3 space. Okay, let's start first of all, actually with the users, often, well, not often, but sometimes forgotten. So what do normal users want in Web3? And I mean, they really, I mean, it's clear, right? They don't care about all the blockchain technologies, the chains, all these things we are talking here, day-to-day -day L1, L2 roll-ups, all that stuff. I mean, they just want to use and access to applications. So maybe they want to play a game they've heard of or they want to just invest into crypto. These are the typical things. I mean, we could go deeper in this, but just think of people who are not in crypto today. And yeah, they don't want the complexity we still have in Web3. So let's think of someone who have heard of it and wants to use his first step. Um, what will happen if he would start his journey? And well, the first pain point is actually the wallet, right? So you need a wallet if you click anywhere, and then you have a big choice of wallets. Let's say somehow you make a choice, then you need to go through the wallet experience. You need to, I mean, install and download the wallet. Then you need to back up a seed phrase, never heard of a seed phrase, all these things. Then you need to on-ramp ease to pay fees. So there are a lot of steps a user need to go through. And yeah, the wallet is actually quite front and center in the blockchain experience. And we at Argent, I mean, we are a wallet, but we think it's actually not ideal. It should be much more invisible, and the application the app should be much more prominent. Um, yes, so in addition to that, um, a user actually needs to learn a lot, often the hard way, right? Like, Security relies on a user's secret, this seed phrase. I mean, most non-custodial wallets today, whether hardware or software, still rely on the seed phrase, and the user needs to take care of it. But he might not really fully understand it. So he might lose basically everything. Um, another thing is users can't make mistakes. I mean, we, we have support at Argent for many years. We see it still day to day that things happen like, oh, you made a typo on the address, funds lost. Oh, you signed something on some fraud page. There are tons of them. You lost everything. Or whatever, you have a virus on your computer, um, which yeah, led to bad transactions. And in general, also, it's still very complex. I mean, you, a user directly interacts with a DeFi dApp, um, complicated financial primitives, and every operation he needs to kind of click through, right? Like allow uh, or approve um, LP rebalancing. I mean, it's quite, quite heavy. So there's still too much friction that normal users can do what they want in Web3. OK. Um, now, what would the dream experience look like? Um, so going through the things like, ideally, you should shouldn't be you you should uh, should not need to download or install anything. Um, you should be able to create an account in seconds. You um, should not need to understand all these complex concepts like seed phrases, transaction fees, and that stuff. Um, also, you should have a simple way to recover an account. I mean, Web two users are used to not losing everything, um, so there should be some way. Then there should be also some fraud detection, because it's early. There's still a lot of scams, so we need something to, to help the users not to run into everything. Everything should be one click, we believe. And last, also less approvals. 
Okay, and then if you think about this list, we end up actually Coinbase, I mean, one of the big centralized exchanges. I mean, they do a quite a good job on that because it fulfills most of the things. It's quite easy to onboard. You don't have all the fraud risks. You have a recovery and so on and so on. But obviously, I mean, what we also strongly believe from the Web3 space, and we have seen many examples why this is important, I mean, we still want to have self-custody. Um, this brings us to another example, which is so rare. Maybe you know it. It's a game quite popular for trading soccer cards. And they built also quite a cool experience that users from Web2 can easily log in with email password or social login and so on. But you still get a wallet kind of behind the scenes, um, like more invisible. But it is self-custodial. So they built this for, them, for themselves, and it's working quite well. But we think one thing is missing there. Um, it would be much better to port the account actually to multiple dApps, because this is just for so rare, right? You cannot use this kind of account on other dApps. OK, so that's what we would like to have. Um, there's one um, problem, or if you look at this list, a kind of attention. You want to have all these cool web, oh, no, these features, but they also want to have self-custody. And that's a challenge to, to achieve. But the solution or the secret to that is, as discussed a few times, account abstraction. And we will go into why this enables a new experience. So what is account abstraction? Very brief. So an account has four main functionalities, which you want to have. You want to, have, you want to be able to authorize transactions, execute transactions, somehow need to pay the miner, and you need to protect against uh, replay attacks. And yeah, all of this on Ethereum and other EVM chains is hard-coded, so you cannot change it. Um, and the cool thing with account abstraction is now that you can reprogram these things, which opens a huge space for you can use different signature schemes, elliptic curves, multiple signers, and we will go through examples. Um, we and Argent focus mostly on Starknet um, because or one of the main reasons is they have native support of account abstraction. And also to be clear here, it really means there is no EOA anymore. Right? It just doesn't exist on Starknet. Everything is a smart contract. And then coming to wallets, everything is a smart account, which by design, which makes it much more powerful on these features. OK, now let's go through that. So how AA works, this is just a graphical presentation. So you have your client and the wallet. It has a key. Then you have your account, the smart contract, which two functions typically validate and execute a transaction. And then well, you sign a transaction. It goes through the account validation, execution, and then it will call a dApp. OK, so first thing. Multi-calls. I mentioned we would like to have everything one click. So today on Ethereum and so on, I mean, it's not if you want to have, you need to have one transaction per call, right? And finally, we have multi-calls here. So we just program the account in a way that it supports it. So you go through the first call, the outcome of this goes to the second call, and so on and so on. But you can do this then in one transaction, which is much better. And we get finally rid of um, ESC20 approved UX, which we still have on most chains. On Starknet, you already today, all dApps, like DeFi dApps, um, yeah, it's just one click. And they do the multi-call with the approve behind it, which is much more intuitive. OK. Another idea is the Paymaster. So getting rid of transaction fees. So I mean, a dApp could decide for the first, whatever, 10,000 users to onboard them. Um, let's just pay for the transactions. And there are multiple ways to do that. And here is one, or the way Starknet will most likely do it. It's not fully there. Um, but you will have a dApp paymaster smart contract. And then it works like that. A client on that dApp would say, no, I don't want to pay for this transaction. We'll specify who should pay. I mean, it's a, the smart contract, basically, of the dApp. 
and then um, it will go through the account. The account will ask the step paymaster. This thing will run its validation logic. I mean, basically depending, do they want to pay for this transaction or not? And if yes, it will go through. And this would enable, yeah, very smooth onboarding for new users because they could just play around with things. Okay. Another um, thing which we would like to have is uh, account recovery with guardians. So to get rid of the problem like, oh, you forgot to back up your seed phrase, you're doomed. So um, um, we could do something like, or oh, we have done this actually on Argent like already on Ethereum, but we do it here as well. Um, you would introduce a recovery service which has a second key, right? And this second key, the only thing it can do, it can recover in the case you lose your key. So, and this we can again implement on the account to make this possible. So let's say there's this bad day, you lose your wallet and your keys, then you need to authenticate to the recovery service, and then um, the recovery service can basically enable your new key on the account. And then you, you're back, basically. Um, you might say, like, ah, I don't like this recovery service. Is this an entity or whatever? You could also say, OK, mm, you, can go ahead, you can use a ledger as a recovery mechanism, right? Or you could say, uh, no, I want to assign this to, let's say, three of my best friends, and they should be the guardians in case I lose access to my wallet. Um, that's another option. So it's actually quite simple with account abstraction to implement these things on the account. And yeah, we have done this already. So another powerful idea is fraud detection with 2FA. So again, you could um, introduce a second key um, on the fraud monitoring service. And now you would change the, the logic on the account in a way that um, you would need, every transaction needs to be co-signed by the fraud monitor as well. And then how it would work, if you're, on a, you're doing something on a dApp, so basically the wallet will um, send the raw transaction data um, to the fraud monitoring service, and this can run then all kinds of checks, like do you really want to send to this address? Nobody has seen this before. Um, you can check, like, oh, you're moving, whatever, 95% of all your assets on the wallet to this malicious address. I mean, there, there are many very sophisticated solutions to do these checks. And then it's like, OK, if it says, no, it's fine, it will just co-sign it, and the transaction, fully transparent to the user, will then go through and execute. Or if it's suspicious, it will challenge you with a 2FA challenge, like, on another channel, email or something that is it really you right like people know from i mean also typical 2fa experience in the web too and then you can still decide if that's really what you want to do or not um, so that's and this is enforced here right like with on chain because we have these two keys good another cool thing you can do is the idea of session keys so we want to get rid of all these approvals, right? the complexity. So here, consider a, a game which wants to do lots of transactions with the user because, I mean, it's an on-chain experience. You need to, I don't know, buy bricks. This is yeah, uh, basically a game to build NFTs out of bricks. You need to buy it. You need to assemble it, all kinds of things. So and every time you need to bother the user right, with the wallet, like sign this, sign this, and so on. But with session keys, you can remove this. So you would only ask the user once for an approved key, a session key, and say, like, but with a, with a um, specific scope, right? Say, like, um, we want to start a session, and we want to spend maximum 10 DAI and on these operations, and it will expire in one hour, right? This is what the UI shows. And then um, the user can say, oh, yeah. I'm, that's fine for me, I, that's OK. I confirm, and then a signed token, basically kind of a temporary key, will go back to the dApp. And then from now on, the wallet is basically invisible, right? You don't need it anymore. The dApp can directly interact and do these things if you click somewhere, which is much, much smoother. So we are working on this as well. OK. 
it. Last one, go passwordless with web concepts like WebAuthn or passkeys. So yeah, um, you might know, like I mean, on a secure clave on your mobile, um, there's, yeah, we, we, in theory, we always could use this directly to sign transactions. But the problem is the cri cryptography which is used on these secure enclaves is not compatible with most blockchains today. So basically, this elliptic curve which we are using is not the right one. So, um, but that's not a problem with account abstraction. We can basically put the logic there that we need and support this. And then it allows that you can directly, you can sign with your mobile directly transactions, also using the biometrics of mobile, um, yeah, which is obviously a smoother um, experience. And yeah, these are the related to the concept WebOS N and Passkey. So yeah, to recap, users um, just want applications. They don't want wallets or chains and all these things, right? I think it's pretty clear. And we need to remove all the friction by bringing the best of Web 2 and Web 3 without compromising self-custody. And account abstraction is the key to do that, right? It basically, if we do all of that, we have a very smooth UX. Um, and yeah, users are safer with recovery and other things. And this is not just theoretical. So we at Argent have built um, a wallet which is um, much more focused on this, uh, which is the web wallet, which can be directly integrated into dApps. And I brought a little video, which would be cool to show. So yeah, you log in with email, connect it, you can do your stuff. I mean, there's just a swap. This shows how easy it is to integrate for developers. Yep. Okay. And last slide. Whoop. Yeah. And this is live with more than 15 dApps on StarkNet already. Um, like all kinds of like NFT marketplaces, kind of an ENS uh, games and um, all the AMMs. And yeah, if you are interested, you can scan the QR code that will go directly to the web wallet SDK. And um, yeah, I think this is, um, ah, and it has uh, obviously smart contracts have an audit. Also the web wallet has a security audit. Um, so yeah, we took what we can care of that. And yeah. That brings me to my last slide. Yeah, thanks, everyone, and I would open for questions. Um, questions? Yeah, yeah uh, are you planning to bring the solution to native iOS or Android? And which could be the challenges when moving to these kind of platforms? Yes. So, I mean, we have, uh, um, for many years, Argent started with a mobile app, like, f I think it's already four or five years there. Um, and it's native, uh, native apps on iOS and Android. And we have also launched now on StarkNet. And yeah, we will bring, I mean, a few of the things are there, like multi cores and all that stuff is already working, obviously, but things like session keys and so on, or the web of N thing, we are working on that. Yeah. But yeah, there will be challenges for sure, because like, if the Apple ecosystem with passkey is a bit different than the Google thing. So yeah, but that's basically in the progress. Yeah. Thank you. Um, does anyone else have any questions? We still have a few minutes until the next talk. Um, I didn't. I didn't quite follow where the like where the private key actually is. Like where is the the use? Because it, so so it's non custodial, but they don't have a seed phrase. So how does that? 
actually where, where does all the secret data live? And yeah, so I mean, on, on it depends now on which wallet mechanism. Um, so it doesn't have a seed phrase. Um, we might have obviously a private key because we still need to sign, right? But um, then, um, I mean, as with the mechanism I've, sh I've shown, um, you could have another key re recovery service, and then later, if you lose it, right, it's not a big deal because we can recover um, basically with a new key your account on chain. So there is this. It's basically you, right? I mean, if somebody, so else, if somebody else has got the key, then that's kind of just as good, just the same as being custodial, isn't it? I mean, uh, yeah, now it depends on on the mechanism. So, yes, if there is just one key and somebody else somehow gets access, but it will be. I mean, in mobile, it is pretty hard to get to this key. Um, or, so that that's not an issue. Um, if the let's say we use the, the the fraud monitor mechanism, there is also a second key, right, which needs to sign every transaction. So if you lose yours, then um, you have actually it's not enough actually. You would also need to be able to authenticate to to um, the fraud monitoring service or, or Argent in, in, in today, but could be others, and um, that it's you to to get the second signature. So there's other mechanisms in place if you just lose the first private key. Yeah. But yeah, and in general, right? Like if you want to have more and more, I mean, you would go for a multi-sig at some point. <laughs> yeah. Uh. Hi. Hi. Um, I've been following Arjun for a while, and you had a great adoption rate in the beginning. Yeah. One, one of the things that made it slow down was when you could not provide the gasless experience anymore. Yes, that's correct. And I still see you proposing the Paymaster as a great feature to onboard more users. Yeah. I think that runs into the risk of having the same problem again, once gas fees rise again. I know you're on StarkNet now. Yeah. But what are the gas savings there compared to mainnet? Maybe a th two thirds less? Oh, no, it's, it's a lot, a lot. Um, so um, right now for a normal transaction, I think you are 30 to 50 cent um, per transaction. But okay, um, that's, that's comparable. Like on to Ethereum. On yeah. mainnet, you pay less than a dollar. But just, but just today, to right? Return. Because we don't have much going on. I mean, I paid much more <laughs> in, in other years. So right now, yeah, okay, it, it's, it's, it's going on. But I mean, there is more. So basically, um, I mean, what is expensive today is still um, the storage, right? So the, the data availability to push it to Ethereum, that's what takes most of the cost. And there is also, I mean, I think like other chains as well, Starknet will bring Volition, which is another data availability layer. And then we go into sub 10 cent area of transaction cost. So it will go lower and lower. Yeah, that's, that's where we are today. Um, so I mean, it depends also then on the, on the depth, right? Maybe they have a different way um, to to, to yeah, basically to make money so they can subsidize it, then I'm, I'm not sure if we as Argent can do it like we had it in the beginning. We loved it and it, it proved actually that it works and that we were kind of right on the ideas. But yeah, if your mainnet costs just killed it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, any further questions? Um, if not, thank you so much, Tom. Thomas. Thank you. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll give a little break until the next talk, or we can we can two minutes until the next talk. I'm sorry.
Uh, we are now ready to start our second presentation of the day uh, from ERA from Protocol Labs. Uh, the topic of the presentation will be uh, the design of the topic will be on design anatomy of a perfect SDK page. Um, yeah, so please give a round of applause to Ira. Where's Beck? And the previous? And for the previous, you can press this one. Get it. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I really wish the screen would be a little bit rotated and you all came a little bit closer, so we do have like a little bit of discussion and the light would not be shining into. I know we are live streaming. Is it okay if I will step off the stage? Like here, at least. So, uh, who have heard about a thing which is called developer experience? Who feels comfortable explaining us what is developer experience? So, um, if whatever product you're creating, if you're creating a product uh, which is for non-developers and you offer any development tools for uh, developers to build with, you also offer the product for developers. And once they start building on your product, that's exactly the big black dot there where they start using. And from this moment, they become a user slash developer. But before this, um, every um, uh, before they start using uh, the development docs, they don't just jump into the docs right away. They do a loop um, that on, on which they always go through some considerations and evaluation. And especially if there are several projects on the market with the same product with a really close SDK, then they will start thinking like, what SDK is better? And before. They first evaluate, and then they all only start developing and using, actually. And only the internal, the second loop, is the user experience. So we don't talk about docs itself today. We are going to talk about uh, what will happen on your website. And the website, as an asset, is on the journey of consideration and evaluation of which SDK to choose. When we talk about the website design, we always think in three layers. And the first layer is information architecture. Um, on this layer, imagine if the website was a city. On this layer, you think about what buildings you are going to place across the city, what type of buildings, and how they're positioned. So do you have universities? Do you have schools? How many factories do you have? Maybe you don't have factories. Maybe you have a zoo. Uh, the second layer is user flows. Um, in general, both of them relate to user experience, uh, so we don't call them at this presentation user experience, both of them are. Um, but on the moment of the user flows, you align their, you try to navigate the particular type of the visitor or habit of this a city into the line uh, or the flow, how they visit one building to another building to another building, so their day life or their journey is completed. And the second level is visual style and UI and wipe. That's where Brandon lives, and that's where you define if it's a, a city, it will be it's a Bauhaus city, or is it a solar punk city, or is it underground? And all of them may have the same structure in terms of information architecture, but they just will look differently. Uh, when I go and run through the structure of the web page, uh, this will be like a navigation and indication on the top corner. So please pay attention on the uh, top uh, left corner. 
First, information architecture, what information blocks do you need? And you discover it through the user experience research and uh, customer uh, audience interviews. So first, you want to talk to people uh, who have been working with SDK, so you know what works, what doesn't work, what they're looking for, what they need. And the second is audience interviews. Um, every time, every company, at some point of their conversation, this kind of building, they will sit together and talk about who we are building for. And within this workshop, you will identify uh, core audiences. That's a very easy case. Um, usually, the case is more complicated where you have segmentation of the audiences. Let's say if you have partners, and but you have business partners and academic partners. So although they um, you work with them in the same way and they expect the same thing from you when it comes to collaboration, their ultimate goals are too so different. The ultimate goals is pretty different for business people and for academic people. Uh, mostly, uh, developers will fall into the main audience, and uh, that's why uh, a lot of information on the website is actually for developers, so you need to interview them separately. Um, and uh, all of those audiences will go through the different types of onboarding journey before they start using. So before users will start using product, they will check like a website, uh, an event page, uh, some newsletters, whatever. Developers may go to the event, to the hackathon, and only after the hackathon, they actually got to the real product, which is dev documentation. And when, regardless to like what type of audience, when you interview, you ask the set of questions. They usually grouped in, in this category, so these are not questions, these are just categories. And after you collect the data and you form the data in something more readable, where you can spot the, uh, how I call, uh, the UX gold. So in this UX gold, you actually see um, where is um, the green dots, is the raw data, that's the gold, and that helps you to form the structure of what they will need to know and what they're looking for on top of what you want to tell, because the amount of what you tell is always a lot. And then when you have this data, you start playing already on two levels, information architecture and user flows, when you see, OK, if they have this doubt, we will put this block information here, and the following question to this question is another one. So how we structure all the blocks, and we keep them in the same learning journey until they know everything and they're ready to go. So let's create a self-initiated project, like Dubcon SDK. Definitely Dubcon SDK cannot have NDK, why four? So let's call it Radial SDK, because we are in the building of Radial system. Because it's self-initiated projects, let's go wild typography, apply some branding, off we go. So first structure, title, intro, button, nothing special. Uh, three common mistakes are done at this step is that uh, too much text on the introduction, because everyone thinks we read a lot of text on the web pages, not. Uh, the second uh, mistake is adding a um, second CTA to go to docs. Uh, yeah, like most common is join the, join the community. Um, you need to remember that this page is mostly for the first time, second time visitors. And joining the community at this first fold, it's too early. They first need to understand that they are here not for joining the community, but they're here to learn about the, your SDK. So you can use the CTA somewhere to the bottom. And the last mistake that doesn't actually very much hurt, but it's a mistake, it's when people add unnecessary copy, like for developers, by developers, or vice versa, it's like, it's SDK, and when it's like one multiple, or when you have it so many times on the website, then uh, with such copy, the website becomes like a Christmas tree of copywriting. Uh, what you can do instead is to use a very sharp line, since no one is going to read it, this will work only for SEO, and it's good if you will rephrase it, the main purpose of the product, but for developers, of course, if it applies on SDK. And what is super important is to put the uh, supported platforms languages right away on the top, because that's a constraint, and sometimes it's good to know at the very beginning, so you save time for visitors. 
The next section is feature section. So at this moment, at this section, there is something that you want to tell. It's like possibilities of your SDK and something that they need to achieve, which is to gain some benefits. And the point one, point three are interconnected. So you first you need to know like, what are the possibilities, and then you can rephrase through a several um, copywriting exercises. They're just like copyright. Uh, how to rephrase possibilities into benefits. Uh, the second one, in case you have a few alternatives of the market and there are a few alternatives offering SDKs, so it's good to uh, highlight what's special for yours and how yours is better. And usually it will look like um, feature image, feature image, feature image. You will have five, sometimes seven, and some of them will be very specific. So y you can link buttons from these features to the particular place in the documentation, and that will be totally logical. But then there might be like two, three features will not have specific. They are like more overall. And it's very tempting to just put a button because we're in the flow of putting buttons everywhere and go to docs, uh, which is a mistake because it creates uh, something which is called CTA clustering. And in general, it uh, lowers the uh, effectiveness of the page in general. So what you can do instead is to group them into non-clickable, just informative features. And if they are very important features, just put them on the top of those that are clickable and bring you to the particular parts of the documentation. Uh, the next section is setup or get started. So get started has first like setup, big one should be super visible, uh, usually big because you can have setups for different environments. Uh, and then learning journey from the beginner to the most advanced. And all of them obviously will bring you to documentation, but not to the overview, but exactly to the point. Like if it's beginner tutorial, this first beginner tutorial. If it's sample, then it's first sample of the flow. Um, then sample projects are most important. So if you want to invest into something, it's better not to invest in the video tutorials or something, but rather to uh, sample projects. And well, if there is someone who is maintaining your page often, and if your page is working like, like a promotional, um, which is actually it is, uh, then it's good. This is a place where you can put the upcoming hackathon guide, some video, or the video from the workshop from the hackathon. So then it creates the learning section, which is very solid. Uh, the next section is DAPs built with uh, radial SDK. So usually people do what? Logger, 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 logger. Uh, another case, we you just big image with some loggers and thousands of apps are using our SDK. Start building and again link to the docs. So that will work only if you have a particular link to the app marketplace powered with your documentation. If not, uh, that's a moment where it's better to like over deliver a little bit and uh, try to find who is actually using and give them a links so people can see that it's actually a real project and also what it will give you that mostly that will be um, smaller projects, like smaller than you, building with your documentation, so they will be very proud to be on your page and they also will have some reason to share your SDK page with uh, someone else and it's like marketing symbiosis. Uh, what's left? There we have advanced resources, frequently asked questions, dev forums, dev chat, and dev newsletter. Advanced resources like white papers, guide, can stay on this page, they're relevant. Uh, frequently asked questions can go to docs because mostly questions will pop up there. Uh, dev forums, dev chat, it's just links to Discord and forum. And then dev newsletter, um, that's a very common mistake I see. Uh, in the space, uh, join our community, which is sign up to the newsletter. Uh, that's a job for the copywriter, but uh, when you sign up to the newsletter, I, you are not joining community. So first, uh, be very clear in the copy. And the second, if you have a product which is for non-technical users and do you, you do a lot of marketing for like outreach, email outreach, 
for non-technical people, try to separate dev newsletter and uh, non-technical newsletter. Uh, that is the best case. Or if your product is primary for developers, uh, then it's good to have a little different copy and just explaining that there are sometimes dev updates. Uh, the structure, first advanced resources, frequently asked questions, get support newsletter separately because it doesn't relate to the learning uh, about the current state. Uh, and, well, because we can, uh, that's the best place to place careers and dev grants uh, in this section. Uh, the end of the page. To sum up, that's the whole structure. That's not very big. It will make you to work a little bit. Uh, but it's just based on collecting the links. Um, if you have been following me, what section is missing? Sign up? Uh, no, we are missing use cases. Apps build with something with your SDK. So in general, we can put them in two places. We can put them under the features, or we can put them under the uh, tutorials. Mm. Where would you put it? So if you put it after the tutorials, which is pretty logical, because it shows the example of there. Uh, how documentation can be used, uh, then it's better to just place logos in the very first because the apps using it, it's a uh, uh, confirmation that it's a working documentation, that's a good one, and it like, works for your marketing uh, and promotion. If you are doing it after the feature, it's already a promotional part. Just make it very strong and clickable and make sure that the best are on the very top. Uh, so, I will skip those three slides, hoping that someone will ask the question that I would like to answer. And we have the last layer left. So, visual style, tone of voice, vibe, which is branding. Um, that what I do for living and for joy for 15 years. <laughs> and if uh, we would like to talk about this now, that would be like... Um, uh, one month's branding bootcamp, uh, which we don't have time today. Uh, but because of this, if you want to dive a little bit deeper to this topic, so if you go to the website, uh, then on the very, very top, almost on the very top, there is a recording from East Denver Talk, uh, where I talk how your positioning can be used for website architecture and branding strategy. And also, this talk is not published. It's also East Denver, uh, but that's a 45 minutes recording uh, of a uh, video that like Minimum Viable Brand, where I actually talk about that very, very, very top layer uh, that we didn't cover today. That was pretty quick. Thank you very much. And if you're around... Thank you so much, Ira. And if you're around uh, for Regions Unite, uh, I'm doing that workshop exactly about this talk, but it's two hours workshop. Thank you, Ira. Um, is, does anyone have any questions in the audience here? We have a few minutes. Uh, hi there. Um, Hello. Is it common to see more uh, of, a, uh, of a mobile first approach nowadays um, as opposed to you know starting with desktop because you know there um, obviously it depends on the, on the context of the product or the service mm -hmm. uh, but nowadays I mean I assume a lot more people users view uh, websites through the mobile so when it comes to the UX UI um, stage um, do generally people start with mobile and then move on to desktop or because commonly I see it start with desktop website first and then move on to the responsive side. Um, in your experience, which do you um, start off with first? It's usually based on the audience. So let's say um, developer, I mean, if you're a developer and just going to jump into the docs, you rarely would be jumping into the docs from your phone. 
right? You need to have it on the laptop. So the first would be desktop approach for this page. Like, what's the next destination? How they will get from the page you are currently here to the next? If the next destination is an application which is mobile, obviously the mobile first will be the first. Uh, but with this one, that's a pretty simple structure. So as you saw there, all the blocks is just one click, and Figma can make your mobile layout right away without any work. Uh, what's your take on um, choosing between maybe going for a more unique look for the docs or using something that's maybe more established in the ecosystem, for example, basing a template on Docusaurus and having like a more tried and uh, tested uh, user interface versus something that maybe pops out more as more unique to your brand? So I will not answer this question because it relates to the doc organization itself. And um, there is, uh, which is a product, so there are special designers who actually work with developers in the experience of development and rearranging this documentation. So I cannot answer this question because I'm on another loop. I'm like, I'm bringing developers to your docs. And then if you're a developer, like if you're a designer, then it will be your job to keep them, I don't know. <laughs> Um, is there any further questions? Uh, sorry, and at what stage would you conduct, like, for example, A-B testing um, for, the, for the website or the service? Um, and what kind of key points to look out for when doing A-B tests and such? Well, for example, that where to put the resources, not the uh, apps created with the uh, documentation, where to put, that would be a perfect moment for A-B testing. And um, yeah, so, and see what actually works better, because um, there's also like sales involved, and especially if you are targeting like bigger companies, so uh, trying to use it in the bigger corporations. Uh, and there is like a software architect involved who is making decisions on all this stuff. Uh, that's a very important moment. And also like the learning journey, uh, especially when you launch hackathons, which is a temporary part of the um, page itself. So one hackathon is out, it's just like section is out. Uh, that also might be a good A-B testing, but this will work for the next campaigns. Let's say. Uh, you're launching Hackathon right now, you don't know where to put this, but I wouldn't know where to put, for example, for very special audiences. Every developer, there's uh, people behave in different ways, you know, even in the Web3 space, Dev space, they behave in different ways. So uh, launch AB, and then you will have a data for the next Hackathon, but then when putting it for the next Hackathon a new updated section, then you will know where to actually put it. Hi, thanks for the call, uh, for the talk. Um, do you have any favorite uh, teams that you would use as reference? Any teams that uh, come to mind that do this really well? Mm, who uses very well? I will hold myself from this, but we can chat about this because they're streaming and I don't want to sound like very promotional for particular projects. Okay, thanks. But we can talk about this later. I have a list. Um, is there any further questions? If not, thank you so much, Hiro, thank you. for the thank great you. presentation, and give, please a round of applause. Um, our next talk uh, presenter is not here yet, so we will have a break until 11. Um, yeah, so please uh, go have a coffee or drink something and we'll be back soon. Thank you.
Hi again, everyone. I'm sorry for the delay in our last talk. Um, unfortunately, this talk has been rescheduled for 4.50. Uh, Eric Tang had a flight delay, so his talk will be at the consensus layer at 4.50 today. Uh, I'm sorry for that. And instead, we'll have um, Maxim from, uh, well, Maxim is my love. Uh, he's been working in the Web3 industry since 2017, and he will be presenting about the five obstructions to crypto mass adoption. So please give a round of applause to Maxim. Thank you very much. Uh, well, this is actually... Cy I'm a cyborg. Thank you very much. You guys can hear me okay? Oh, I was running here. Sorry, I'm still catching my breath. <laughs> um, I have a few disclaimers. So one is that this presentation has been prepared without any use of any AI tools whatsoever. So it's 100% human-made content. So it's pretty cool, I think. Uh, another disclaimer is I know we're televised. There is a live stream. We're shooting it. I don't want this presentation to be used by any AI tools and analyzed by, by them. That's just the thing that I say before any presentation that I give. <clears throat> my apologies. Uh, so yeah, my name is Max. Been in crypto for a number of years now. and. Uh, I don't know, somehow increasingly I've become more and more frustrated because I want crypto to be a little bit further ahead, not in terms of the price, right? But in terms of adoption, in terms of I want my parents, maybe my friends to start using crypto for fun and profit, but they still don't do that. What's happening? And uh, over the course of the years, and again, I've been in crypto since 2017-ish, I sort of collected a number of stories and some, have some ideas about what may be happening. I see some problems that are happening within the crypto space, and that's what I would like to share with you today. But first, CP Seep. My wife says that. She'll love it. <laughs> um, anyway, so why are we not further along? I see this problem, and uh, I work on a project where we absolutely require normal people to have crypto wallets, to be able to operate with crypto. And again, and again, and again, they don't, right? I have a good friend of mine who I taught about crypto. Uh, we registered his first crypto wallet a number of years ago, several years ago, and I visited him recently. He's a uh, managing director of a big hotel in Switzerland. So, and what I saw in his office is his seed phrase pinned to the wall of his office. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, we're doing something wrong here. Some, what is happening? And so I see this problem as this. You go to a person on the street and you tell them, hey, register a crypto wallet, have a crypto wallet. It's amazing, right? And so you have two problems right away. First of all, it's so stressful to operate one, right? Again, management of your seed phrase, sending transactions, you have to verify everything a number of times. Uh, but let's imagine, and you know, a friend of mine who just walked in, he's saying that, hey, we're getting there. The UX is getting there. It's going to be there very, very soon. What time is it? Um, but the second problem, let's say you give that person a crypto wallet, it works amazingly, it's a no hassle. Why would they do that? Why would they register a crypto wallet? Because the only use case that we see today that's working quite well is pretty much gambling. Hey, buy Bitcoin and then wait for the price to go up or maybe go down. Ether, same. I look at the... <laughs> anyway, um, so the only use case is gambling, and DeFi is uh, sort of like in the same realm, kind of, 
Maybe not really. And so today I wanted to talk to you about the five abstractions uh, to crypto mass adoption, right? What is happening? Um, I think I, I was so inspired, you know, when uh, we were starting working on our project, when I got into crypto, about this sort of selfless vision of Satoshi Nakamoto, who just gave us this thing, right, Bitcoin, and, and completely disappeared. It was amazing on so many levels, right? Of course, we don't have our expectations attached to, you know, a person who may say something online or may not. Uh, but yeah, it's the selflessness of this act that was so inspirational to me. And, and when we were starting our project, we did the crowdfunding. And, and again, it was so great because now we are detaching from the investors in Silicon Valley, from VCs, I thought. Uh, and, and we no longer uh, are in their realm of control, right? Because, I mean, what's happening really is um, that the money controls your project when you take a VC funding, right? So, of course, you're familiar with the concept of fiduciary duty, uh, that if you take money from VCs, if someone else is investing, uh, then you are ob obligated legally to operate in such a way as to increase their... Uh, ROI, and that's it. And if you don't do that, you may be uh, going to go to jail, right? And so the first obstruction, I think, is the greed that uh, many, oftentimes, is attached to decentralized projects, decentralized projects that then take VC money, right? Which is a it completely, it doesn't make any sense, right? Bitcoin, does Bitcoin have VC money? No. Does Ethereum have VC money? No. Uh, and there was a number of projects, of course, before that we use today. Projects, you know, like the personal computer the, uh, or just the idea of a computer that they try to patent and they couldn't. The World Wide Web is in public domain. Like, we're enjoying all of the tech that we're using today because all this chain of technologies up until today doesn't have this attachment of greed, doesn't have this ex expectation of profit at the end of the day, right? And so it's, it's a little bit laughable when I see a decentralized project that claims that uh, they're decentralized at the same time they have VC money. Um, and so another problem here that uh, many of you crypto anarchists are familiar with is <clears throat> the fact that today, uh, and that's been happening for, for decades now, since, since 1970s, that return on investment uh, basically makes you more money than return on labor. So you're much better off not doing anything but just having a bunch of money than doing an honest man's work, right? Uh, you can look it up, and, and there are economical studies from McKinsey I saw recently, 2022, I think, where they analyze that this sort of economical disparity. Um, there is a paradox here, right? The paradox is that uh, our whole capitalistic economy is set up in such a way that we're optimizing for one single variable. And in my previous talk, in in Prague, at ETH Prague, I was talking about how uh, it may be a type of AI that we programmed already incorrectly, right? Uh, where we're optimizing everything not to make paper clips, you, if you're familiar with the concept of paper clip maximizer, but with money maximizer. And so that uh, strong AI takes everything around you, all sorts of different resources, including humans, and converts everything to a number in a database. Um, and, and I simply call that behavior, you know, like you look at how animals behave in the nature, right? They have their algorithms, they have their programs, they, they fight for territory, they fight for domination, they fight for resources in order to survive. We no longer have to do that, right? Uh, and so I, I sort of the fight that we, fights that we see today between different companies, it's kind of 
like as humans, we could behave in a humane way, but we decide sort of to let the greed run the show. I call this super animalistic, right? Like using all the human powers, all the human resources and ingenuity, we're still behaving like animals, just fighting for resources that, um, as they say, you make money uh, to buy things that you don't need to impress people that you don't like. Anyway, second obstruction is a lot of the stuff, I, you know, my friend is speaking in, uh, in Singapore um, today, I guess, and I was just looking at the list of speakers there as well, and the, the titles of the names of those projects, WorldCoin, the tools for humanity, you know, it's like, I'm going to save the planet, that says on <laughs> everywhere, everyone's face over there. And so the second abstraction is, is narcissism. And I think, you know, in a lot of cases, and in a lot of people, and I have the same problem as well sometimes, that we're like, no, I'm smarter than that other guy, and so therefore I'm going to build a better, better and bigger version of whatever they're doing or whatever, right? And that prevents us from working together, from, from collaboration. And again, that's the name of the game. It's open source. Bitcoin is completely open. We have to work together in order to run it. Ethereum the same, right? And I think this kind of altitude, uh, altitude, attitude um, prevents us from, from working together uh, and from creating really great things. Um, Elephant in the room, right? So we are, my project uh, is, is in the travel space, which is completely dominated by a few large corporations, really a handful. And uh, they will fight us tooth and nail not to make the decentralized anything happen. So we talk about, I don't know, what is, what is, Interesting. What is hot today? There is self-sovereign identity. You know, uh, again, another friend of mine, acquaintance, I guess, uh, working on identity project. Supposed to be completely decentralized and completely everything, but no. Microsoft comes at the end of the day and they say, "Hey, no, we gotta do it." And and of course, all the other companies, all the other governments, uh, who are they going to trust? Some rando off the street. <laughs> or Microsoft, who is going to provide them with sort of self-sovereign identity service, which, you know, with a ton, a ton of strings attached. Like, I don't believe in that at all, that Microsoft is going to give you your unique self-sovereign identity at all. And the governments, why would they allow for uh, money that they cannot track, for identity that they don't control, for any type of solution that prevents them from tracking you and from really acting as a corporation because at the end of the day, again, they have to act like that. They have to make money. It's, uh, they have to make a profit, right? So that's the third obstruction. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to just run through it, right? So fourth obstruction is the ridiculousness of Web 2.5. It just doesn't work. Right? If you want to do something that's truly decentralized and, and we say, okay, let's compromise on this one part right now, and, and by the way, we're going to raise money for that tiny part that's compromised, it just simply doesn't work. There is no motivation after to change things up uh, at all. Don't do Web 2.5, please. And five, and I guess that's related to, to narcissism, is, is we want to save the world somehow, and, and recently uh, another good friend of mine uh, recommended me this book, Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott. He's a professor of agricultural studies at Harvard. Read that book. Don't try to save the world. Um, and if you remember that book, The Sovereign Individual, which was supposed to be, I guess it was for a while, the Bible for for Bitcoin blockchain community. Um, it says the sovereign individual. So maybe, just maybe, and I don't know, maybe you will tell me later that, that blockchain was never meant to be 
was, was never meant to be adopted en masse, right? It's a tool for individual liberation. Use it today for your fun and profit. Um, it's hard. The mass adoption is hard. And, well, you know, so five problems. I have a few ideas, five antidotes to those problems. So, and I would like to spark a discussion. Maybe you, we can, uh, you can ask questions a little bit, well, right now, in about a minute, or grab me later, and we can talk about these things, right? Uh, first problem, if you remember, was greed, and there is this amazing thing uh, from the Western, uh, sorry, from the Eastern philosophy that's called the law of karma, right? Uh, I don't know how familiar all of you are, but basically, you're not supposed to make new karma. Actually, y your goal to achieve enlightenment is to shed all of the karma, to get rid of all the karma, and that's how you achieve enlightenment. Karma literally means doing. So you do things all the time, therefore you create new karma, never going to get there. How do you do things that do not create new karma? You don't have any expectation about the result. Don't have an expectation of monetary result, any type of result. Do things that you otherwise cannot not do. Just do that. Do them because you have energy, because you have uh, the ability to do them. Don't expect things, right? The moment you attach an expectation, uh oh, karma. So that's one. Um, I was reading up uh, a little bit of psychology um, literature on how to, how to deal with narcissism. Well, they say self-love and self-compassion, right? Because narcissism uh, comes from, I guess, you not loving yourself enough. You are just fine, just, just as you are. You don't have to achieve great things to be loved. Just, just saying. Uh, the third, the corporations and, and government. Well, you know, a picture comes to mind from The Matrix, the movie, where uh, Neo is in that pod and all sorts of cables are attached to it. And I'm thinking about my phone in the same way. So every app is that cable that goes right into my brain and controls uh, all sorts of chemicals in my brain, the dopamine, all sorts of uh, hormones and stuff, right? Uh, so just give you that picture. Think about what you want to do with it. Uh, fourth problem was Web 2.5. Just don't do Web 2.5, just, just, just do Web 3. Um, and the fifth uh, problem is save the world. And one of my favorite philosophers, really, of all time, his name is George Carlin. If you're familiar, you would know. George Carlin, Saving the Planet. It's on YouTube, look it up. So he says, <laughs> how arrogant do you have to be to say that you're going to save the planet? No, you cannot even save yourself, and you're trying to save the planet? Just be humble. Be, be kind and do what you can without any expectation. So that's it. Questions, guys? Thank you. Thank you, Maxim. Uh, does anyone have any questions? We have about three minutes. Thank you very much. I would like to know why um, we always look at Satoshi as one person, individual, and we don't some uh, maybe his entity, he's a company, yeah, or a group, and also we don't speak uh, at all about how greedy. Uh, to mine about 1 million Bitcoin, uh, estimated. So wh why don't we also look uh, from this perspective? Thank you. But, um, but what's the question? So, um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is like a philosophical uh, point of view. Mm -hmm. I would like to know your take on this, since you talk a lot about the, the adoption and not to be greedy, while I see like the Bitcoin creator with a whether it's a company or a person, was so much or too much greedy. So what was he? How so? I, I don't know. Yeah, Teach the, me. The, yeah, elucidate okay. me. Okay. The, the estimation uh, tells that uh, there is one address that mined Bitcoin uh, yeah. up to 1.1 1 .1, uh, million. Yeah. Okay. Which is 
um, most likely done by Satoshi Nakamoto, whether a group or a person. So this is very, I see, a greedy uh, step to be taken. Uh, that's an interesting take, because if he ever takes that money, it will, I mean, what can happen to Bitcoin? I don't think anything good is going to happen, and therefore the value of that Bitcoin is also going to drop, and, and everyone sort of will see. I think it's going to stay there. Uh, you know, if that topples, everything is lost. Guys, go home. <laughs> More questions? Unfortunately, we don't have more time for questions. All right. Thank All right. you so much, Maxim, for the I'll great presentation. Thank you, guys. Please, so, a round of applause. Um, and up next, we can uh, greet uh, Stephen Horvath from uh, Luxo. Uh, please, a round of applause. He will give a presentation about building the next generation of dApps with universal profiles. Very excited to know more about the, that. Thank you. Okay, this one is the next one. Uh, this one. That one, okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Stephen Horvath, and I'm representing this pink mob over here. Make some noise, please. <laughs> and yeah, I work for Luxo, and I'm the team lead of the browser extension project that we have called the Universal Profile Extension. And Luxo was, is an Ethereum Layer 1 compatible blockchain started by Fabian Vogelsteller and Marjorie Hernandez. Um, you are probably familiar with some of Fabian's work and have probably used some of it. Um, here are some of the standards that he created and the technology. And Marjorie is a fashion expert. She has uh, several recognitions, including most recently she was named as one of the 50 most important Germans in fashion. And they came together and created something new. They created a blockchain that focuses and targets the creative economy. What is the creative economy? The creative economy is all about influencers and uh, musicians and artists and writers, basically anyone creating something new, creative, innovative. And it's all about everybody who uses those things, which is basically everybody. Blockchain has some history of being very biased toward finance and toward uh, anonymity, and those things are very important, but they're not the only thing that blockchain can do. If we look out in the world, people are social. They, want to, they have identities. They want to show off their identity. They want to get people to know them in, in different ways. So if we want to make blockchain more usable, we need to, if we want to have more adoption on blockchain, we have to look at what, what are people doing already? What, what are they able to do and what are they not able to do? These are my parents. Let's start with what they're not able to do. So they're not able to use most crypto wallets. They have to try to attempt, they're going to try to attempt to a dApp. They're going to choose which wallet out of the many presented. They have to figure out what they are. They have to add that to their browser, choose a password, figure out what the heck a seed phrase is, create a seed phrase, confirm the seed phrase, figure out where to store the seed phrase, where no one can find it but themselves. Then they're presented with gas. What is gas? Where do you buy gas? Register for a centralized exchange. OK, now they have to send an ID, and they do have to do a face scan and send it to uh, you know, some, maybe they don't even know where the geography of the exchange is where they're sending this information to. Then they can buy some ETH, figure out what their account number is, link their account. Finally, they can transfer ETH to their wallet, and now they can use it. Blah. It's so much work, and you can see why, I mean, not just you know, people in my parents' generation, but people who are my friends in my generation, they're very technical per people, but you know, they, they get stuck at step three. You know, and I go and, and I talk with them about blockchain and everything that it can do, but they're not able to see the, the power of it. 
So what can normal people do? What can my parents do? They can post on social media. They can install an app on their phone. They can very easily sign up for a Web2 account that's not, not out of their range. They can walk into a cell phone store and they can roughly figure out what kind of data plan that they need. They might not know what a gigabyte is, but they know that if they're just sending emails, they probably just need a little bit of data. If they're watching a bunch of videos, they need something more. So Luxo was created to solve a lot of these usability problems. And the main thing that we're offering are our standards. So today I'm going to show you the power of the Luxo standards, what you as decentralized application developers can do, how, how you can use these. And I'm going to show it through the product that I've been working on and my team has been building for the last months, which is the Universal Profile Extension. So. Without further ado, here it is. This is the Universal Profile Extension. You may notice something right away, that you don't see tokens on the main page. That's because the Universal Profile Extension is not a wallet. It's about profiles. Nothing, about, nothing wrong about tokens, and actually, you know, there's a whole, the finance part is important, it's just not the only thing. And, we, and I'll talk a little bit later about um, some new standards that we have that actually improve the finance aspect also. But the extension that we offer is profile-centric, not token-centric. An account on Luxo is more than just a long hexadecimal string. An account on Luxo has information about your, your name, has your bio, has an avatar, a profile picture. It has all of these things, so an account on Luxo comes alive. Here you can see a user, she's got three different profiles. On the left, she's got her personal profile, so you can see she's got, you know, she talks about her fashion, she's interested in music, and she's a traveler, she's got her profile picture. In the middle, this is her business profile, so uh, she's, she's involved with the DAO, and she's an architect, and she does her design work. And then on the right, this is her investment account. And here, she actually stays, she decides to stay completely anonymous. She's got an avatar, she doesn't reveal her real name. So, and none of these accounts are able to be traced to each other. The way that we do this is through our standards. And one of the standards that we have allows you to actually attach metadata to your account. And you can see here, there are a lot of different fields. Like I was saying, there's the name and the avatar and some tags. There, you can attach unlimited metadata to your account. And the ability to do this opens up a huge array of possibilities. So one of the really powerful standards that we have is what we call our key manager. And this allows dApps to actually request control of various parts of the profile or the account in, ver in very fine-grained ways. And you can think of this kind of like when you install an app on your phone, and the app wants to access your photos or access your contact list, the app actually has to ask permission for you. And then you can decide, do you want to give that app permission to your photos or your contact list if you trust it? If you don't, you might not be able to get the photo functionality in there, but you know that you're safe. And if you do, then you can allow it to happen. So we're doing the same thing, however, we're doing it on chain. And you can see here, this is what the extension looks like. And you can see that there are a number of different dApps in here. So we've got a music app, we've got a, um, a DAO, we've got a recovery service, we've got the extension itself. Um, and through the key manager, you can create a controller. Each of these controllers has different permissions that it can request. So here you can see some different permissions. You can, the, the dApp can change the user's profile data. It can sign on behalf of the user. It can encrypt or decrypt messages on behalf of the user. It can transfer tokens on behalf of the user or the native token, Lux. It can deploy smart contracts on behalf of the user. And it can even add additional controllers or edit these permissions itself and more. Now, there are a lot of different use cases that this opens up. So you can imagine a music or a game dApp 
that maybe has application data, maybe like a playlist or a configuration, these can actually be associated directly on the user's profile. And permissions can be granted in a way that allows it to only change the, the keys that are relevant to the D app itself, not be able to change the, the user's name. So those can be requested too. Multiple devices. So in the Ethereum world, you know, we, we take seed phrases, and if we have uh, a wallet on multiple devices, we're, we're pasting around these seed phrases everywhere. Well, if one of those devices ends up getting compromised and your seed phrase gets lost, then you basically lose access everywhere. But here, we can actually give a different device. Each device can have its own controller. And by default, that's how the, the extension works. It'll give, anytime you install it on a new device, it gets its own controller. And therefore, if one of the devices ends up getting lost, you can use another device to revoke access from that first one. Account recovery. So you can allow a third party, either a friend or a service, to have, to, if, to, if you get locked out of your account, to give you access back to it again. We have this concept of vaults. So you can kind of think about this as like, if you're in a family and you've got a child and you want to be able to give a certain amount of tokens or a certain type of token to your child for an education platform or a game, you can grant your child access to this without having them access your entire set of funds. DAO management. So in a DAO, there are different types of users you can have a, um, a marketing manager, for example, that is able to change the profile data of the DAO that maybe feeds into the website, or a treasury manager that is able to only transfer tokens or only certain types of tokens. Or you can have an admin that's able to grant new users access or restrict their access. So like I said before, gas is probably one of the biggest pieces of friction on, in the blockchain world. And like I said, it's, it, it, it's something where you know, even very, you know, very smart people, you know, anyone who's basically not a geek has trouble here. You know? <laughs> um, so we've really looked at this. And the way that we fix this at Luxo is through what we call our, our transaction relayer. And here you can see a view of, uh, of our dApp. Um, you can kind of think of this as like if you go into a cell phone shop and you need a data plan for your phone, yeah, you get a monthly quota of gas. If you use that gas um, before the month is over, you have to wait until the next month before it to reset. Um, or you can top it up in the meantime. So we do the same thing, but with gas. So we take that, we take that, the pain out of that. Users are, are still signing their transactions in, their, in the extension itself, but the transactions are run through the relayer. And you can, you can pay for that with a credit card or with um, with crypto, various ways. And so we've actually created a standard with this. We, like you see, we have our own, our own relayer, but we actually invite you as developers to come and compete with us. By having diversity, it actually improves the ecosystem and it gives users, users choice. There are a lot of different types of models and there's a lot of room in business models for how somebody could build a relayer. So this is a really great opportunity if someone, somebody wants to try this. And actually, um, one of our, our team members will, will be having a meetup tomorrow at, in Berlin at our office, and one of our team members will be giving a, a talk. Um, Calum, raise your hand tomorrow. So if you want to come and learn how to do that, come, come and check it out. And you can see the extension actually builds natively support for the relayer. So you can see there's the quota mark, um, the quota amount in there. You can see exactly how much quota you have left. And you can see the drop-down box right above the bar allows the user to select whatever relayer they want. You, you can, um, and the DApp can add additional um, re, uh, relayers if they like. Digital assets get an upgrade. So this is what I was talking about before. So ERC-20 is, is you know, super widespread. Um, that's what everybody is using. But it has a lot of limitations. And so we've been looking at these limitations about what else can be possible. How can we make this a better experience? So as you probably all know, one of the biggest pieces of friction is if you send your token to an invalid address by accident. So this happens all the time. You're, you think you're on Polygon, but you're actually on Ethereum. You've got an Ethereum address. You try to send some tokens there. And, but you're actually on Polygon, and boom, your, your tokens are lost forever. 
This is happening all the time. And I know when I'm, whenever I'm sending any significant amount, I'm always double, triple, quadruple checking, and I still end up sweating and feeling nervous about sending something. So at Luxo, what we have is what we call the universal, universal receiver. And an account can be marked as universal receiver. And then if you try to send a token to, that, to an account that's not marked as a universal receiver, it's actually prevented on chain. You can see here um, the error that you see in, in the extension when this happens. You can actually override this. So for you know, people who know what they're doing, maybe they, you know, it's, it's a normal account, but they know what they're doing, you can override that. Um, but that's actually validated on chain. You have to say that you force the transaction in order to do that. Another ability is the ability to add unlimited metadata to both tokens and NFTs. And if you've ever developed a dApp that has NFTs or tokens and try to deal with metadata, you know this, this is a nightmare right now. You always have to rely on a third party to provide this data. There are different, sometimes the third parties are out of sync. You never know who to ask, where to get the right data. It's very confusing. So here on Luxo, everything is on chain and everything is associated with the, with the asset itself. And therefore, if you're a token, if, if you have your own token or you create an NFT and you want to change some of that data, you just change it on chain and it's updated everywhere. And then lastly, there is the, uh, what we call a token hook. So in the Ethereum world, if you receive a token, it, you usually have to rely on a third party service to do some sort of polling. There can be mistakes. It, it's, a little, it's a pretty clunky experience. But what we have is what we call a token hook. So what that means is basically every time a token is either sent or received, both the sender or the receiver receives an event to their account. And this, this first of all, adds a, a way better user experience. So you can have notifications whenever you receive something, but it also has the ability to programmatically respond to receiving a token. So you could do something like if you receive a token from a known address, you can forward some percent of that token over to a third address, like paying automatic tax payments or paying a contractor, something like that. You can also do something where if you receive a token from an, an unknown address, you can decline to receive that transaction so, you, so it never ends up in your wallet, so you're preventing scam or, or spam tokens. And lastly, I, I want to talk about a couple of dApps that are currently building on Luxo and what they're doing. So this is Universal Page, and basically Universal Page is an all-in-one NFT marketplace, and it empowers creators to be able to have their own landing page in order to, to uh, showcase their work. So and it, it does three things. It gives you a personal Universal Page uh, with, with your own link to show off your NFTs. You can sell NFTs through the platform, and you can do drops here as well. If you have a collection, you can create an account just for your collection, and you can host that right here very easily. And then the second one is Upturn, and what these guys are doing is basically, it, it's like a loyalty program, um, but on chain. So basically, you can think of it as if you have, um, if you go to your local coffee shop and you buy 10 coffees, you get a little card. When you get your 10th coffee, you get a free coffee. This is the on-chain version of that. So basically, what they're doing is if you go to some, some number of events or you um, share some music um, on social media, then you can actually get rewarded with, with tokens. So they're using our, our, uh, our token standards in order to do this. And this talk was actually very good timing because for the last weeks, our team has been really working hard to launch our beta, and it just got released yesterday. You can actually go on Coindesk, and you can see there's an article written about us. Go and check it out. Everything that you've seen here is from the beta that you're working on, so these are, you're seeing some brand new things here. Um, so scan the QR code, give the extension a shot, and come in our Discord, let us know your experience, and come build with us. Thank you so much, Stephen. Um, does anyone have any questions? We have a few minutes for that.
I mean, I have a little bit to add. I mean, Fabian here, I'm actually the founder of Luxo. Um, so, like, this is basically a whole new account system, a smart contract based account system. This is the ultimate of account abstraction, if you will. And it's a standard based account abstraction that means it works everywhere uh, on every chain, but obviously it will be on Luxo be first because we're having all the, the, the shenanigans around it. Um, but it really will change the UX problems that we see in the space. You know, I mean, like the, the talk before, I mean, I wondered that there was not UX as one of the issues <laughs> talked about, uh, uh, you know, of adoption. I think that's the main, actually, issue of all, everything. And uh, we believe we solved that. You know, try out the project exchange and see how easy it is. And you don't need to get Lux or test Lux or anything. You just click through and you have your blockchain account and you can go and fly. Um, and this will be launching on mainnet uh, within the next few weeks and then things start to get very, very different in blockchain. Thank you. Um, any further questions? Thank you so much, Stephen, for the great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and now we'll have a, a lunch break. We'll be back at 1.20. 30. Sorry, I'm sorry. 1.30. Uh, and um, yeah, thank you.
Hi, everyone. We're going to start the talks now, so please take your seats if you're going to stay. So, first up in this afternoon session is Stefan Cox from the M3 protocol, and his talk is Secure Communication and Effective Spam Protection in Web3 Messaging. Thank you very much for the introduction. Who of you likes spam? <laughs> One. I think all of us had made the experience that our inboxes are filled with messages we don't want, or our messenger gets information from somewhere we don't have, have had contact in the past, and that this information is not, nothing we want to have. In the current world, there are some protection mechanisms. Now, today, I want to talk about this aspect of Web3 messaging, how this can help us to make a very good spam protection in the future. Yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit about the messaging world and everything which is around this. Then I want to give you a short introduction into the DM3 protocol, what we are doing, and the approach we propose to solve these problems. And then yeah, we will talk about the spam protection and what mechanisms we have in Web3 and how we can use them effectively. So when we go back in history, the first real messaging solution in the internet was email. So in the very beginning, in the 70s of the last century, there started messaging by having the ability to send an email from one to, one to another. And this was actually one of the first real killer applications of the internet. So a lot of yeah, traction came to this because now it was possible to send fully electronic a message from one position to another. So at this time, Messages were not encrypted at all. Actually, at this time, this was a kind of weapon. It was uh, hosted by the military, so in, in private usage, encryption was not really available. But it, uh, it, it was a kind of decentralized because we had these different post office servers, and this worked well. And we know all of us are using email, and when we look back to to our beginnings, it was something really interesting. Now we are using it still, and it's exactly the same. Not encrypted for the most times, but yeah, used almost everywhere. In the last 15, 20 years, we also did see these messages coming to life. So first we had this internet messenger like ICQ and others, and then WhatsApp and others came and, yeah, and filled a whole space in our communication. And right now, it's so that most of the people are using Web2 messengers for their communication with friends, family, and also for business reasons. So it is nice, it works well, it's really convenient to use, but when we see these ecosystems, they are completely closed and yeah, separated ecosystems. If I'm using one messenger, I cannot communicate with someone who is using another messenger. Now, these are closed ecosystems. Yeah, and they are controlled by uh, these big companies. They are controlling the user data. They are controlling uh, my identity in this messaging ecosystem. And yeah, they are, uh, even if they have encryption installed right now, so most of the big messengers are providing encryption, a lot of messaging, messaging solutions are not providing encryption until now. So if you are in a website where in-app in messaging is, uh, for instance, if you are using uh, a video uh, portal, then you, you always you have messaging components, and in the most cases, you don't know, is this, is this communication encrypted, is it not? If I am leaving this tool, can I access this, uh, this information again later? Uh, we have these silo systems. And if they are going down in Germany several times in the last years, even the big messenger servers went down and no communication was possible. So what are the problems? Now, I mentioned most of them. We have the encryption problem. So for email, it's the, the, the most reasonable problem. So I don't know who of you received sometimes an encrypted email. So I tried it for several years. I sent my public key always with my mail. I never received a single encrypted email back, always unencrypted messaging. 
Then we have privacy. So when I'm using such a centralized messaging service, even if the message is encrypted by itself, the metadata is not. So the, the provider is fully aware of what or whom I'm contacting. And so these metadata are not private at all at the moment. I'm not self surrendering with my messages. If I want to move from one messenger to another, it's not possible, or almost not possible, because I'm not controlling my messages. They are controlled by this company. So interoperability, I also mentioned before. So if I'm using messenger one, and my friend is using another messenger, I cannot send a message. It's not possible for now because they are closed ecosystems. And yeah, most of these big messengers also have not the, the real intent to change this, because if they are the monopolists, they are fine with this. Centralization and single point of failure, I also mentioned already, that we have these, uh, these services. And if the service goes down or blocks me, I'm out of the system. Yeah, and last but not least, spam. So especially in the email world, so my email was uh, revealed in some hacks in the in the past, so it's almost unusable. Even if I'm using spam filters and all the things my provider is giving me, I get a lot of spam mails. And also, in the other direction, it works not very well. Sometimes I receive an important message, and it is marked as spam because some rules of the filter are filtering this message out. So what can Web3 do? to make this situation better. So first, we have key-based, uh, yeah, we, we can have a key-based identities. That means all or everything is connected with my wallet. And having my signatures makes very clear what the message, or the, where the message comes from, and it's connected to me. So nobody can take over my identity. And I, I should be able to self-sovereign control where my messages are located and what I'm doing with these messages. We should do decentralization, of course, and so that we don't have any single point of failures. Encryption privacy, of course, is mandatory, so we don't need to talk about this. This is something it must be. And something we practice in Red 3 is also very important, diversity. So we learned it from the clients in, for the blockchain. It's really important to have diversity. Because if someone breaks or something breaks, something else can run. And when we look in the messaging world, we have if we have different messengers focused on different problems or different communities, it's really a good thing. But what we need is interoperability. We need to be connected even if we are in a different ecosystem or in a different uh, community. And yeah, I already mentioned spam protection is very important. And with web free mechanisms, we can do a very good spam protection. So, but what is really essential? It is essential that we can share the encryption and transmission information. We are using a central but decentralized registry using blockchain based on ENS. We have a, a registry where all this information can be published so that others can get it and contact me on the platform. The second thing what we really need is a decentralized system. We are using a decentralized system of independent nodes, which act as relays for the messages, so that if I want to send a message, I look into the registry, get the information where to deliver, and then this delivery service node relays this message until the receiver picks it up. And nothing more is needed into this network. And of course, interoperability is important. If Web3 messaging wants to be successful in the future, we need interoperability. We cannot do the same mistakes which are done in the Web2. So we need to be interoperable between all these different messengers, all these different ecosystems. With this intent, we started several months ago developing the DM3 protocol. And we, uh, yeah, we designed DM3 as a layer 0, layer 1 protocol for messaging. Why layer 0, layer 1? Layer 1, of course, you can use the DM3 protocol to build your application on top of it. Now, if you want to build a messaging application, you can use this protocol. Everything is fine. But we are also providing functions for a layer 0 
protocol, which means we can use DM3 to connect other messaging protocols or services together so that we can build this connected ecosystem. As I said before, we, we are using ENS as the central but decentralized registry for this information and this network of decentralized delivery service nodes. How does it work? Yeah, when one user is sending a message from, uh, to someone else, he looks into the registry, gets the information how to encrypt the message, gets the information how to deliver the message, and then picks one of these independent delivery services and delivers the message. These delivery services are, are, are holding or caching these messages until the receiver is picked, picking them up, and then the message is deleted from the delivery service because then the application of the receiver is responsible to, uh, yeah, to, sh to store and to, uh, uh, to, to um, work with, the, with this message. And also these delivery services can act as gateways to other ecosystems or other services. Uh, for instance, if there is another network which is also providing messaging, they can use a delivery service to receive the DM3 message and inject it into this other network. And with this, we have a very easy way to connect to uh, other services. Even if these are centralized or decentralized services, we don't care. This delivery service network makes it possible to have these gateways to all of these systems. So I don't want to talk a lot about this picture. I only want to show it to you. This is the tech stack of the DM3 protocol. We have this base layer on the blockchain with ENS as the registry and also other name service and the ability to uh, link sources from other sources like layer two or centralized service into uh, your ENS domain so that you can share your profile if it is on layer one or on any other location where you have stored it. Then we have this protocol layer and I talked a little bit about the transport or the message transport protocol. Now this is this, this bar uh, in the... Uh, this part here. We, we have this message transport protocol, which is this lean based protocol for transferring messages. We have a lot of other protocol extensions, not all of them are already implemented, so that we can provide functions which are needed in any messaging application. And then we have this application layer where we have these interfaces to, uh, to other protocols or other solutions, and we have these embedded solutions so that you have components you can use inside your DAP, and with one single line of code, you can add a full secure messaging in your application, building on top of this ecosystem. So now to the topic of, of today, so how can we now use Web3 technology to have a very good spam protection? Within this ecosystem, we have two ways to prevent spam or to, uh, to block spam. So the first is server-based, which can uh, act on this delivery service directly, so without any interaction with the user. And then we have client-based solutions, which need an interaction with the user. Yeah, let's, let's look at, at this. We have, that means spam protection is something which is in the protocol layer and something which is in the application layer. So first of all, we, yeah, we can have black and white lists. So we know it, yeah, you, there are lists, for instance, from Drake or Ladoric, so where they say, okay, these addresses are known spammers, you should not receive a message from them. We can use this blacklist, but as all of us know, blacklists in blockchain world is not a very efficient way. No? If I, if I block or set an address on a blacklist, of course, people can generate a new address, and yeah, it's, it's a game nobody can win. But for regulatory reasons, it might be very uh, important to uh, stop existing or well-known spammers to send messages. On the other side, we can also use whitelist if we have a closed ecosystem, but yeah, this makes it very complicated because yeah, to receive a message, the, the sender must be on the whitelist, which which makes it very uh, complicated to register. So for regulatory purposes, it's good. For spam protection, it's, it's more a weak protection. It's not that, that good to use. So the next thing, we can prove the activity of the node. So the sender, the address of the sender, can 
be checked if there is the nonce higher than zero. Now, if this is a new address, the nonce is zero, that means yeah, with this address, nothing has been done in, in the past. So, and if I want to prevent spammers from sending spam from newly generated addresses, I can say, okay, I only accept messages if the nonce is above a certain value, maybe one, maybe five, or 10. So which means only used addresses are able to send messages. That makes it very expensive for spammers. Now, if they want to generate a lot of new addresses, they have to do transactions with these addresses before they can use it for spam, which uh, it, it's, it's a good barrier. It's, we call it medium protection. Now, it helps to, uh, to, to, or it helps to uh, prevent spammers from easily generating new addresses. Then also we can check the ownership. If this address holds a token or an NFT, I accept the message. If not, I don't accept the message. So that makes it also very expensive for spammers because if they want to use a new address, they have to transfer tokens or NFTs or, uh, or coins to this address before they can use them. It's also for them very inefficient. For the user on the other side, it's in the most times not that complicated. So now with this, we, have, we can do it. We can do some filtering on the uh, on the server already, but then we can do much more in Web3. So wh what we provide is you can take your message and deposit tokens on this message, with the promise that this message is not a spam. And what happens if this message is marked as spam by the receiver? These tokens are burned. So and with this, it is very expensive for spammers because if I say, okay, I only accept messages with tokens in the value of, let's say, 10 euro, then someone can send a message to me, and if I mark this message as spam, these tokens are burned. If I accept this message as a regular message, then they receive the tokens back. So they don't have any costs on both sides, but for spammers, it becomes really, really expensive because if they send messages which are marked as spam, all this money is burned. And I can uh, take it in the other way. I can also say, okay, let's accept messages, for instance, for ads, for advertisements, if they have a payment on it. So that the user can say, okay, I'm willing to accept advertisement messages if they are paying me, let's say, an amount of X. So and then I can send a message directly to uh, the receivers with this amount locked to this uh, message. And if they accept and read the message, then the payment goes directly to the receiver. So it's the same, maybe the same costs like I have if I'm using an advertisement on Google. But there I pay for Go to Google that they uh, we have sent a link to my web page, and here I can send this in, or the, the money directly to the receiver. So, and I don't need any intermediate in between. So, with, with these protection mechanisms, that we can have these blacklists if we need it for regulatory purposes, that we can have a proof of activity, the nonce, we can have a proof of ownership, that we can see if there are tokens or NFTs. On this, uh, on this address, and this locking from tokens to a message so that this, mes uh, that this will be burned if it is spam, we can build a very secure and very, uh, uh, very easy to use spam protection system. For the end user, it, it, it doesn't really see that the spam protection is in work. Now, we don't need a spam folder for this, now, where, where we filter out messages because of content. Here we say, okay, if these criteria are fulfilled, messages are accepted or not, and yeah, everything based on Web3 technology. Okay, let me give a summary of my talk today. So we talked about the challenges we have in Web2 and Web1 messaging today, encryption, privacy, self-running, interoperability, and so on, and that with Web3, messaging solutions, we can solve these problems very well. But we have to keep in mind, and I repeat it once again, if we try to do it in Web3, 
separately like it is done in Web2, we will not be successful. We need interoperability, we need the way that we connect our ecosystems together. And we can use these technologies very efficiently to have a spam protection so that we can use our messaging solutions with very efficient algorithms so that messaging of the future can be done based on web free messaging. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Stefan. So the floor is open for questions. Thanks, nice presentation. I have a question. Um, could the dark, web, uh, the dark web be motivated to use this protocol? You, you mean, so of course, yeah, you can use every protocol for good and for bad things. That's true. Uh, so we cannot prevent people from using a product. We cannot prevent them to use blockchain as well as we cannot prevent them to use PGP and the protocol. So yeah, that, that's the reality. Question over here. Yeah. Um, so one of our clients, they want to do this direct advertisement uh, with payments, but they want to also create profiles for the user so that there is a more of a discoverability whom I want to send a target ad to. Would this be something that you would be interested in supporting? Um, that this would be more of an integration to use your new network as the payment layer, but then a discoverability of the, of the people, so basically a profile of their data, and then on the other side, the advertisers would be able to, to access this. Would this be something interesting for you guys? Then we could have a follow-up. So it's an interesting question. So if I understand it right, so there is someone who wants to send advertisements to users, and then yeah, they, they can use the DM3 protocol. So it, and so the user decides if they want to uh, receive such message or not. So we don't have any personal data of the user at any time. The DM3 is fully self organized by the users. The only thing which is uh, which is available is the address and the, pro and, and the communication profile which is on the uh, ENS name. So this information is available, but any other information, if I want to, have, want to have some personal data, this depends on the user, if he is willing to send it. Sure, this would then be the part where we would integrate your protocol, but the functionality seems like a perfect fit because yeah. this is exactly what should happen, this payment. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I saw someone raise their hand on the other side of the room. Yeah, they were first. I'm coming back to you. <laughs> Thanks, great talk. Um, so the biggest problem that I'm seeing is the uh, nodes. Uh, how many nodes you have? How do you set them up? Uh, what are the incentives uh, for the node operators? Can you talk a little bit more about that, just to understand y yes. how the relaying happens? Yes. So. These nodes, so we, do, we as DM3, we don't want to operate these nodes. So we are providing the protocol, and everyone can run such a node by himself. So I can run my own node at my home server, or I can take any provided service node which is provided maybe for a payment or whatever. So the good thing on DM3 is that these nodes are complete, completely independent. Now, they are not connected. So that yeah, it scales very well because yeah, new nodes can be added to the network and increase the, uh, the, the bandwidth of, of the network. So your question is how many nodes are operated? So at the moment, we are operating some nodes from ourselves. And we, uh, the protocol is in early stage. We, we now have published the specification. We have published the reference implementation for this. And we are in contact with a lot of ecosystems and tools that they start now to implement it. So, yeah. But why would people run nodes? It's one of the biggest problems of any type of uh, network. What's the incentive for someone to be like, oh, yeah. So, so the question is, why, uh, why should people run nodes? So, so first, I, uh, for, for me, for my uh, communication, I sh should run my own node for this. So, or if, if someone else is providing the service, then there, should be, there will be a payment for this so that uh, I... I take the service from this company and then have a payment for this. 
So thank you so much. I'm sorry I told the people that I'm coming back, but we are out of time for this. So please find Stefan in the break if you have more questions. Thank you once more. Yep. Thank you. And then the next speaker in this session is Hassan Malik from MetaMask, who will tell us about MetaMask snaps and why they will revolutionize developing dApps. Hassan, please. Oh, yeah, no worries. Hi. How's everyone doing? Uh, is everyone familiar with uh, MetaMask Snaps by a show of hands? Anyone? Cool. OK, so uh, for those who aren't, I'm, I'm going to introduce you to Snaps in a little bit. But I'd like to walk you guys through uh, the history of MetaMask and how we've been revolutionizing Web3 and making it easier for developers to make dApps. Uh, so this is the agenda. Uh, we'll be walking through the history of MetaMask, uh, the problems with our current architecture, uh, what we see as the next revolutionary step in, Meta, uh, in, in Web3, MetaMask snaps. Uh, and then I'll be talking about some standards uh, and then some closing remarks. So uh, how have we made it easy for devs to develop dApps? Uh, we started with the injected Web3.js provider into the window object. All you need to have is MetaMask installed, and you're good to go. No need to set up your uh, node. Uh, it, can be, it can be daunting to set up a node yourself, maintain that, and interact with it. It seems like a lot of friction uh, to get started as a dApp developer. Uh, and, and you know, doing install, injecting Web3.js into the window object was a way to make it easier for uh, developers to just start making dApps. What was the next step? Uh, in January 2021, we stopped injecting Web3.js and moved to our current setup, uh, window.ethereum. Uh, so we currently have two ways to, to get started building a dApp. Uh, we have our uh, MetaMask Detect Provider package, and we have our uh, MetaMask SDK, which is a, a bit more robust. Um, and then moving forward, uh, we introduced uh, wallet methods uh, that made it more convenient for dApp developers to create a seamless experience. Uh, so here's a list of the, the wallet methods that we have. We have wallet request permissions. It'll let you request permissions uh, to, to ETH accounts. Wallet get permissions. It'll show you what permissions that you have. Wallet add Ethereum chain. Uh, you know, it'll open up a prompt for you to add uh, a, a new chain. Wallet switch Ethereum chain. It'll let you switch a chain. Uh, register onboarding. It'll let you register your dApp uh, to kick back to after the onboarding process. Uh, wallet watch asset. It'll let you register your NFTs. Uh, wallet scan QR code. Self-explanatory. Um, so moving on forward, uh, what is the problem with our current architecture? So to show you our current architecture, we have the MetaMask extension, we have MetaMask Mobile, and uh, we have the dApp that interacts with, uh, with both through JSON RPC. Uh, it relays requests to extension, and then those get relayed over to our uh, node provider. So does anyone see uh, bottlenecks in this architecture right now? By a show of hands. Anyone? So. The, the bottleneck exists at the, at the node level and at the extension level. So what this means is that if, if, if we're only dealing with Infura uh, and it makes it difficult to, to, to do transactions on non-EVM non networks. Uh, so it, it would, it would, you know, we've been traditionally an Ethereum wallet and, and, and now an EVM wallet. Uh, but we can't move past that if we have this architecture. And, and w uh, similarly, with, with the extension, uh, you know, we have a, a set API that we're building uh, that developers will, re will, will rely on. And the thing is that they have to move at our pace. Uh, and so that makes it difficult for the wallet to grow quickly with, with people's uh, needs and wants. Um, moving forward, we have. 
you know, we have too many features to build. We have so many issues open uh, that it makes it difficult from a manpower perspective uh, to be able to uh, address all the things that people want. Uh, so what is our solution to this? Um, we also have too many chains to support. As a landscape grows larger, it becomes more difficult to provide for a consistent and rich experience. Most chains have different variables, and it makes it difficult to reliably do things like gas estimation. Non-EVM chain support, just like as I was mentioning. So what is the, what is the solution to this? Uh, MetaMask snaps. So what we have decided is to decentralize the wallet. So what are MetaMask snaps, and why do we need them? Snaps is a platform that allows anyone to extend the ext uh, functionality of MetaMask without asking for permission from MetaMask or from anyone other than the end user. A snap is a JavaScript program that is ran in a sandbox execution environment. It lets you interact in new ways with the wallet and essentially modularize it. And how do snaps work? Uh, snaps utilize our existing permission system to request a set of permissions from the user when installing a, a snap. And so these permissions uh, let the DAP developer do interesting things. Uh, the set of permissions that are currently available for the platform are, are at this link provided. Uh, and some of the, uh, so, some of the, so SNAPS works using methods in JSON and RPC requests similar to how DAPs interact with our Ethereum provider now. Uh, and so some of the SNAP methods that we have available are SNAP managed state, SNAP get BIP44 entropy. Uh, you can see that they're prefixed with SNAP. Uh, so this is our architecture currently uh, with SNAPs. Uh, it, it's, it's a bit small, uh, but you can see the, uh, you know, we, have, uh, we have the SNAP, we have NPM, we have MetaMask, uh, we have our execution environment, and so all of these work in tandem uh, to be able to execute the SNAP code and, and get back the results uh, to the extension itself. Uh, this is an example of uh, uh, a sample snap. Um, you know, these are lightweight JavaScript programs, uh, similar to AWS Lambdas. They they have an ephemeral life cycle, um, and uh, so if you see, uh, you know, we ha we have exports. Uh, so this is the most common one on RPC requests. So whenever a snap gets uh, an RPC request, it would it would render uh, it through this code. So we think that everything is good now, right? We've, we've, uh, you know, uh, we have this great permissionless platform. We, we have an API uh, where we expose certain methods that developers can use, but this is not good enough. Uh, how do we know what people want? How can we get feedback from the public? How do we handle what we call protocol snaps, uh, which are essentially pushing us into a non-EVM world? What are the rules of engagement? Instead of sil siloing the, the work within MetaMask, uh, we want to get people involved with what we do and how we move forward as a whole in the space. So this leads me to uh, sipping on a cold one in mi casa. So what are SIPs and what is CASA? SIPs stand for SNAPS Improvement Proposals. Akin to EIPs, these proposals help shape the platform and allow for anyone outside of our organization to get involved. We've already had a few people uh, write SIPs, and, and these SIPs definitely help us uh, set the vision for where we want to move forward in the SNAPS platform. What is CASA? Uh, CASA stands for Chain Agnostic Standards Alliance. It's a collection of working groups that create blockchain agnostic standards. Uh, so some of the work that we're doing there uh, currently, it, it has to do uh, you know, with multi-chain. So uh, current, current work is CAPE 25. Um, it outlines the request for a DAP to multiple chains. Uh, and, and this is ongoing work. This is work that's open to the public. Uh, and and, and you know, these are things that we would like input from, from the greater community, from DAP developers. Uh, and so some closing remarks. Um, we have some links here uh, that'll show you how to get started with SNAPS. Um, currently, 
uh, snaps are allow listed, uh, and um, uh, you know, snap developers would have to get their snap audited uh, to get added to our allow list. But in the future, we're, we're hoping to move towards a permissionless distribution uh, um, scheme. Um, so here you can see the link for our uh, GitHub repo for the SIPs and also the, the repo uh, for CASA. Um, yeah, this is pretty much it. Uh, if, you, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free. Thank you so much, Malik. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Snaps are cool. Um, can snaps talk to each other? They can. Cool. OK, short and sweet. Hey, thank you. So it basically opens up the app store problem of, of curation, right? Could you expand a little bit how you think about what gets a snap approved? Is it just having an audit, or are there still going to be any yeah. other criteria of what you are going to allow to interact with MetaMask? Right. So uh, currently, the way it works is that we'll we'll work closely with Snap developers, right, to to help them to even get started with a Snap and create the Snap, uh, uh, you know, if they so need. Uh, you know, we have great documentation right now, uh, but the process of getting into uh, our allow list would be. Yeah, to uh, get audited uh, by uh, by some firm, you know, we have firms that we can suggest as well. Uh, and then the idea we would be reviewing the audit report ourselves, and then we get uh, add you to our allow list. Uh, but in the future, uh, we're hoping to move towards a, a scheme where we're not, you know, the gatekeepers to this, and and anyone can create a snap and and you know have it installed within the extension. Um, <clears throat> now. That, that can seem daunting, right? Anyone can create a snap, and, and, and anyone's uh, snap can be executed in extension. That's why we're moving uh, iteratively in a, in a manner where we can make sure that in the future, uh, so, you know, DAP develop, like malicious, DAP, uh, malicious snap developers wouldn't be able to get their code into the extension. So that's why you know, we're starting off with allow list, and then uh, we're currently exploring solutions how to get this into a, a permissionless distribution. Thanks. All right. Yeah, thanks. Um, do snaps have access to uh, signer accounts? For example, to support smart contract wallets. Uh, yes, yes, we're working on uh, we're working on account abstraction as well. Uh, there's a question in the back. Ah, there you go. Yes, I was wondering how you're ma how you're managing that balance with security, um, since it's you know the the browser extension is such a Right. Um, you know, so potentially that's, dangerous place. It, um, yeah. Where, where do you draw the line, and how do you plan to do that in the future when you get to that point when you're you know, potentially allowing any kind of... Right. Uh, so uh, to, to explain that a little bit, to talk about the security aspect of snaps. So the snaps are ran in a sandbox ex uh, uh, execution environment using secure ECMAScript. Uh, so uh, if, if you remember, I was talking about permissions uh, and how snaps work with permissions on top of our permission system. What those permissions do is they afford certain globals uh, to this execution environment. So uh, if you guys aren't familiar with uh, Secure ECMAScript, they have a, a compartment module that lets you uh, run code inside of it. Uh, and so uh, these permissions, they would afford certain globals to it. So uh, it, you know, if a snap doesn't have permissions, it can't do anything outside of that. Got it. So you have an interface between the core MetaMask logic and the environment that yes. the is running in. Cool. Thanks. Uh, the App Store was mentioned before. What guarantees do we have today building on top of snaps that you will not at some point say you create revenue within your snap, we want some part of that revenue? Oh, no, we're not. Uh, we're, we're not looking to make revenue off of snaps. The idea is to uh, increasingly let users modify the wallet how they see. I mean, uh, 
MetaMask has other, <laughs> other, other revenue streams, and, and uh, Snaps uh, is not necessarily something that we're looking to like, make money off of. Uh, um, you know, Snap developers, they can certainly create models around their Snaps uh, 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 to do so. Um, and, you know, we, we have a, a few uh, partner Snaps, uh, Transaction Insight Snaps, that you know, have certain models as to like, how many free insights you get. And then based on that, you, know, you might have to pay more money. But we're not looking to make any money off of Snaps. But no guarantees. Uh, what's as, that? There's no guarantees as of now. Uh, I mean, I I can't say for sure, but yeah, like that's not in our in our strategy. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say you know yes or no, but yeah, it's not in our strategy. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Malik? All right. In that case, thank you once more. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to take a short break now. The next talk starts at 2.20, which is exactly in 10 minutes.
So the break has come to an end. So if you have some exciting conversations to continue, please do so outside the room because our next speaker is starting, Simon Emmanuel Schmidt from Edge and Node. And he will tell us about supercharging Web2 data with Web3 technologies. Work. Okay. Woohoo! Nice. Oh. Hello, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Simon. I work um, as a developer relations manager for Edge Node, and I work on the Graph protocol. And uh, yeah, today uh, a little bit talk about the, the rough ideas of how we can bring Web two data into Web three, uh, obviously with the graph. Um, yeah, and let's jump into it. Um, so Web2 data, what is this? I mean, it's like a big term, and, um, but, but uh, I have some use cases in my mind that, I, that I'd like to discuss here. So um, I spent some time on ChatGPT to find some, uh, not ChatGPT, that was mid-journey, uh, getting a little bit addicted to it for, for my presentations, but um, to have some use case that we can describe here. So one classical Web2 data use case is uh, airplane seats, free airplane seats. Like there's a whole thing about uh, airplanes and seats and which are free and which aren't, uh, and so on and so forth. And it's a big industry also going on with kind of that data brokerage. Um, but that's actually interesting Web, web 2 data that we might want to bring into Web 3, but the question is how. Same and very similar uh, kind of data sets are uh, free hotel rooms, um, especially the, maybe the ones that are uh, short-term free. Um, it's again like we have data sets of, 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 of hotel rooms that are free that, that hotels would like to kind of uh, give away so that people can book it. Um, but again, like very complicated data systems currently. Um, also, like a, a one use case that's interesting that we see on the bottom right is um, actually uh, server data or like uh, traffic data. Um, that's a use case that, uh, that is actually already explored. We, I go into this deeper, but like there's this idea that all these servers, they all collect data all the time, like access data, when someone access, what is the, how quick was the response of that access, um, which website was ac accessed, and so on and so forth. Like also very interesting data that can be used or also published. And last but not least, the idea of, um, and that's a weather station, I don't know if that's, that's clear, kind of the, the idea of having weather stations that publish data like publicly in so, somewhere and that then we can then kind of get that data from the weather stations back somehow into Web3. So that's stuff that we explore. All, all these kind of use cases we have in common, like there is a lot of data, it comes from a trusted centralized source, but like the usage of the data uh, could be very in interesting. So, so we don't necessarily need like a trustless, you know, the pu pure system of like, oh, we really have, which, which the blockchain by itself represents, it's kind of good enough. Like, so if an airline says, these are the seats that are free in my plane, like we don't need another oracle that kind of um, uh, says that data is true because the, the airline says we can trust it to a certain degree. Um, but anyways, and, and also like the data is useful and it's something that we, we might not want to protect because like the airline is, ver is very interested to get rid of the, get rid of the um, empty seats. They don't necessarily need to have like an access control of who can see which seats are empty or not. Uh, at least a subset of seats um, are there. Same with, uh, with, with server data. Uh, some amount of the, that one we might want to give. Sure, like we don't want to uh, publish uh, all the IP addresses and stuff that query our server, but uh, like some stuff we might want to open. And um, the problem is op often with that data is that that the data is there. It might be useful for other people, but it's not directly useful for the business that collects that data directly, so they don't publish it. And so in the next co couple of slides, I, st I start to kind of develop this idea of how can the graph help to uh, publish that kind of data or make it more easily accessible. Nice, let's jump into it. So what is the graph? I don't know who knows what the graph is. Please uh, raise your hands. Okay, so we can make it anyways a quick refresher. Um, yeah, so uh, that could be an animated GIF that all that takes this mess of all these different uh, balls, which represents transactional Ethereum, into buckets of um, ordered data. So kind of the graph is this infrastructure protocol that sits in between, initially built for, for front ends that, um, that need to display data from the blockchain. 
and the, and the, the, the graph, if the subgraphs, they sit in between. So like they, they make it easier for front-ends, but also like a data science applications to access data from chain, because like we know, the Ethereum blockchain the archive node is three terabyte compressed. So that's not, that's not the easy, easy data to quickly go through. So the graph sits in between as kind of this indexing and query layer of blockchain data. Um, so we talk about like the data layer of F3. Um, but also, the graph is a decentralized network. I think that's the most important thing. Like, there are 281 indexers. Uh, these numbers are actually changing all the time. Uh, the index is coming, and sometimes they go, but like, it's roughly 200, and, but mostly growing, right? Uh, 281 indexes. We have like uh, 11,000 or more delegators, more than 2,500 curators, and uh, more than 1,100 um, subgraphs on the decentralized network. Um, so that's a cool thing. So we have a decentralized data network that can uh, that that everything works for data um, for data collection and, and also data distribution. And as of now, we have, I think that even now that the, the, this number went up to three million GRT in query fees since the decentralized network launched. So it's it's kind of of going on kind of a, a decentralized data network. So we have truly decentralized data. That's the goal. Um, so, and the, the graph consists of this simple entity called the subgraphs. And we can also think about subgraphs in a way like we can put on this lens as uh, read oriented roll ups. So, it's a little bit uh, a big term, read oriented roll ups. But, like, we can think about okay, so how, how does data flow through these subgraphs? So, a subgraph consists of, uh, a subgraph also always is kind of attached to the blockchain, um, or at least initially. And then it, it listens to events on the blockchain, or uh, also it can also have call handlers, block handlers, but basically looks at data on the blockchain. And according to what's going on on the blockchain, it decides to store some stuff in a database. Um, and the, the language that we use to, to facilitate this is either assembly script or now Rust with substreams. And the mappings that decide what data we want to store into the, into the store can also read from that database. So that simple data flow of like data comes from the blockchain, will go through the mapping, will be stored, and then in the end will be queried um, by consumers. That's basically the, the data flow in subgraphs. The cool thing about assembly script and Rust is like both languages are Turing complete languages, similar to Solidity, which is also Turing complete, which translates into basically you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, so like a, a Turing complete language can, for example, like download a file or an image and compress that image and store it into the database. Or a Turing complete language can generate audio if you want. Uh, there is actually some projects that do that, generate audio with a subgraph. Or you can, I don't know, uh, calculate some CK proof over data that, that, that was seen or something like that. So, so it's a really powerful thing to have a, a Turing complete language. And also, uh, the whole thing, actually, I think uh, two years ago, um, kind of come, come also in this idea, like, so we have a Turing complete assembly script, so maybe we can build something on top that kind of uses that as then it's by itself is being a blockchain. So uh, that, that this project actually developed into a, almost kind of a social, a social network that, that only uh, had very small anchoring on chain and then built on top. But I explain a little bit more how that worked. Um, oops, I need to go here. So basically what happened is like that the subgraphs can also download data from IPFS and RVF, um, so that they come up with this idea of uh, we can simply have a data edge contract, which is as simple as that, like only a fallback function. And whatever we send to that fallback function, the, the smart contract by itself does nothing, but the cool thing is the data is stored on-chain. So either we can start to send some data on-chain and have a subgraph then that ingests this and transforms it directly, or we can also send data on-chain that links to data on IPFS or now recently shipped RVIV, so the subgraph downloads this and does something out of it, right? So that's the rough concept. Um, so what happens is like, or according to this example, that uh, the logic moves from the blockchain to the subgraph. And I kind of hinted it already, uh, the, the graph is, or subgraphs or graph nodes are, are able to download data from IPFS on RVIV. And this is, this is where this starts to get uh, interesting. So 
Um, so, the, the, so, so primarily, the, the, the graph subgraph looks still at the blockchain, but it can then see uh, hashes from RV for IPFS and then downloads that data. That could be like huge uh, uh, JSON files, which, which can be loaded and then analyzed inside of the subgraph and stored in, into the store. Um, so that was actually uh, tried out by one of the data scientists at Edge Node. Um, his name is Craig. And so there are, in the graph network, there are multiple gateways which facilitate um, that clients can query uh, in, into the graph. Like this, this is this, uh, a very common setup that we have gateways uh, to a decentralized network that also applies to the graph. But what's important is that that data that's collected on these gateways um, it's very important because it's, it basically says like which subgraph receives how many queries, which indexes serve that query, how quick were, were those indexes able to respond to that query, how much, uh, uh, per, how much um, money per query did this indexer um, get for that query, and so on and so forth. And, and, and if, if you have thousands or hundreds of thousands or billions of queries, um, that really gets into very interesting data that just on the gateways. But like, since it's a decentralized network, that data needs to be accessible publicly. Like Everybody should have access to that data, although it's traditional Web2 data, because it's kind of collected on a server. So they, so they came up with this idea of like, it's a little bit of a complex um, thing, but what basically happens is like the gateways take that data, the traffic data that they have, and upload it to IPFS. Taking that IPFS hash, only just send that IPFS back, hash back on chain, and then there is a subgraph. That, in the, that downloads that, that uh, traffic data from the gateways from IPFS and starts to generate the subgraph that gives us great insights about like which index has which quality of service, which subgraphs are queried the most, and so on and so forth. A very a cool system. And that same system can apply, could be applied by, let's say, uh, yeah, an airline company that wants to kind of get rid of, of the last seats. Why not just uploading a list of seats for flights like uh, on, onto IPFS, anchor it down on-chain, and then having it um, distributed by, by a subgraph or the graph. Another, um, another possibility would be um, uh, think about weather insurance, on-chain weather insurance. Uh, dive a little bit deeper into how, how this works, but basically, uh, let's think we could have a, a network of small weather stations, independently operated weather stations that people just run on there or have on their, on their houses that collect data about like how much wind do we have and how much rain or something like that. Um, and since they are independent, we can kind of trust. But now all these weather stations would then upload like every 15 minutes maybe a JSON to uh, IPFS or RVIV, but anchor it down on chain, and then we have a subgraph that would then collect all and aggregate all that data because they also have like um, the the coordinates of the independent weather stations. Um, and that could unlock very interesting use cases. And the cool thing here is like, when it comes to data publishing and also giving access to the data, we can't rely on the decentralized graph network that's already existing. So when we have these data sets and these subgraphs as described, we can just publish them to the graph network, and then they are automatically indexed by the indexers, and we don't even need to uh, think about access control, um, rate limits, and so on and so forth, because the graph network by itself already has that, has that baked in, that um, when someone wants to query the graph network, they need to uh, get an API key or whatever the gateway is offering for access, and then to, to access that data. And so that's given, because a lot of times that data is not published because it's such a headache to, pu to publish data. As I say, like if, if I would be the CTO of such a Web2 company and have interesting data, and that someone might find interesting, then I think about, OK, what do I do? I open my server, so that could be an attack vector. Maybe I, I have too many requests, so I need to work on rate limiting. Or maybe I need to uh, want to charge something because the server is not for free, and so on and so forth. With the graph, that's all kind of solved. Just need to upload to IPFS and leverage the graph network. Um, yeah, now it even got, got, got easier like, to query the graph. Like, there's the new um, billing, subscription billings on, online that, um, that we can pay with um, USDC on a monthly basis for a fixed amount of queries. More innovation here is coming, so that's really something. Now, talking, to, talking about that um, weather oracle example from before, uh, now, when we have a subgraph that has aggregated weather data, it could be actually used for uh, on-chain 
insurance co smart contract because if, if there is some trust in, in, into that data, we kind of know did it rain in Berlin or not, right? And then that could then trigger the, the insurance, is it paid for that festival that should have happened or not? Um, because now we have the data in the subgraph, and we can bring it back on chain. Like there is uh, the, the chain link functions that are just, I think, uh, two mon uh, some months ago first launched, but also the Gelato Web3 functions, uh, which are around for a while, that can both ingest data from the graph there are, um, and then put it back on chain. So that's very cool. So we can have like off chain data coming to the graph and then being in the subgraph, being um, processed there, and then finally put back on chain. Um, so that kind of fills up with this uh, idea of the read-oriented rollups. I mean, we see rollups that, that, that just have like st that there will be st state coming up from the main chain and will be written down to the uh, to the L2 and going back to the L1. And with read-oriented rollups, um, yeah, we see like the the data comes up or maybe even from from other in uh, will be quicker to access, but also can be then uh, rolled back on chain with uh, with an oracle. So. This is the idea here. Um, there is one word to be talked about about verifiability. So when I, so when someone runs an, an oracle, how do we know what? How can we trust the, trust the data? So there are different levels of verifiability of data on the graph network as of now and in the future. So as of now, all indexes submit like in a in a repeating period the so-called proof of indexing. So what they do is basically they say, I saw this and that data. And I prove, or like I, I signed that with my private key and I put it back on chain like a, a hash of, of the data that I saw. So indexes can compare with each other. Did we all see the same data? Um, that's for one. And then when someone sends a query to the graph network, uh, the indexer, the response to that query, also sends in an indexer at the station. And then they say, I as indexer, blah. Um, this is the response to that query, but I also say it's true. Now, it could be that the index, for whatever reason, sends a malicious or like a wrong result, uh, either malicious or like um, because they don't know how to run their server properly. But if they do this and with the index at, at, at the station, query at the station, they can be slashed. So this is actually data that can then influence the probability of, or the verifiability of the data that can be put back on chain. So an oracle can take the query station and put it also back on chain, that later on, when someone can prove the index wrong, they can be slashed. And then now we know um, index is stake, and then the more index is stake, the more they are incentivized to actually give the correct answer, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, but that's not bulletproof, right? So there is also like a whole core development team working on the graph, uh, semiotic AI, but also people from Edge Node that are working on this idea of verifiable indexing and verifiable querying um, with direct proofs of, of when receiving the index at station. Although these are hard problems to solve. I'm not an expert in the, this, this mathematics, but um, yeah, that, that's actively worked on and um, we'll get better. So um, that was it. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, you can scan that uh, QR code. That's my Twitter. DMs are open. If you have any questions, I can also send you the slides if you want. But I think we also have time for questions. Absolutely. So who would like to ask some questions first? Hi. Um, I'm a data architect that focuses on bias. Do you think the verifiability could help basically elaborate or explore like the epistemological origins of data bias and algorithmic bias? Is that something you guys have been looking at? Data bias? Yes. Uh, what kind of data bias? So for example, gender or racial bias. So at the point of indexing, there was a bias inherent due to sort of cultural context or historical mm -hmm. context. Is that something that you guys have been exploring, that use case? Uh, no, but that could be that could be part of the subgraph actually, because the subgraph is the one is kind of the, the entry point into into the data into the system. So like yeah. whoever writes that subgraph could could start to to have some algorithms looking for these biases, because also you can write the subgraph with assembly script which is too incomplete and could we could load something into this. Okay. But uh, it's I mean this is very like it's not very uh, well, very used that concept now. Let's try present and hopefully inspire some people to yeah. to play around with this. 
And sorry, second question. Yes. Um, I have a lot of clients that their onboarding issue into Web3 is the fact they can't compute and analyze Web2 data or sort of like with Web3. So say like they have smart contracts or NFTs and then especially hotels actually I work with a lot. Is on the analytics layer, is there a tool that you've been using that can kind of visualize both Web2 and Web3 data together? Yes, so uh, the subgraphs in the end are um, accessible with uh, GraphQL, the data okay. from, from, the, from, from the graph. So whatever, like if, if, it's web two, web, if it's Web3 data, which is the yeah. graph very well known for, yeah. like for most protocols that are subgraphs, look at the ones from Messari. Mm -hmm. They have very high quality subgraphs uh, that can be used. But also when we follow that flow here to bring in Web2 data into Web3, in the end it will be queryable with uh, GraphQL. There's also... Um, Currently, one research uh, path going on of um, to explore how if the graph network can um, give SQL access yeah. to that data okay. because in the end it lives in a database. Yeah, yeah. That would for data scientists li li be more handy. But there's also a tool that that helps with with Python mm -hmm. to access data from the graph network. It's called Playgrounds. Okay. Um, so yeah, you can scan my QR code and ask me this question. I send you all the links. Any other questions? Uh, one of my favorite things is a saying that the event logs are the cheapest storage in Ethereum. Um, with verifiable indexing, um, is this just as strong as uploading state to Ethereum? Like, like, if I had a choice between a verifiable index, I just for example, just create a smart contract and all it does is emit an event. And that event is captured uh, by the graph and then we have a verifiable index that runs some sort of logic. Like, if, in your estimation, is that just as strong as having state on Ethereum? Yeah, uh, if, yeah if, you if, it, if you think it's true, right, um, theoretically, if you think it's true, you have an indexer, uh, we have verifiable computing, the data is received, we have, a, we have a hash of that data, so it's kind of like true. Then, uh, and then the, the, you send the query and the, and the query is also verified and end-to-end, and, uh, -end, the th whole thing is verified. Then, theoretically, it has the same uh, security assumption. But that being said, like, for what I know, we are kind of far away from it as of now, but that's the goal, yeah. And that would even kind of lead into this idea that, that there might be the idea that a smart contract can directly query the graph because it's so verified. But that's kind of dreamy, dream far away future. We still have a little bit of time if someone has more questions. In that case, thank you once more, Simon. Thank you so much for having me. So we're taking a tiny, tiny break of three minutes. We will reconvene at 45.
please take your seats if you're staying for the last talk of this session, which will be given by Inesh Santos Silva from Athena DAO. And the title of her talk is Building a Bio DAO <coughs> in the Women's Health Space. Hello everyone, uh, excited to be here um, yeah, uh, to, to talk about Athena DAO and what we are building uh, with our bio DAO. My name is Ines Silva, I'm one of the co-initiators and the ops leads at Athena DAO. Um, and basically our focus has been around how can we really change uh, the women's health landscape. I will tell you a little bit about the problem, so why we actually decided to uh, take this path, what we are doing, and uh, yeah, and maybe ways for, uh, for you to get involved. So the first one is like what we are saying. So we are, uh, we want to be the leading decentralized community focused on translational women's health research, education, and funding. And everything started because um, if you are a woman, you probably know that um, sometimes you go to the doctor and they have no answers for you. Uh, sometimes, a, a lot of the times, you realize that you are quite alone in, um, in, in sharing uh, some of the, the, the issues you, ha you have been going through. And you find that weird, right? So every week I have conversations with women, basically all around the world, that tell me, sometimes with tears in their eyes, like how alone they feel. Uh, because they, they, don't, they don't go to the doctor, they, Basically, they go to the health system, and for some, uh, for some reason, there's like no answer for some of the issues they have. And, um, and this is just, just show, shows part of the problem, right? So if you look at the NIH budget, a very per a small percentage goes to women's health funding, and this has uh, many reasons. Part of them is because for a lo the longest time, we look at women as smaller versions of men's bodies, uh, and we, we thought like, ah, oh, maybe we don't need to study women's specific conditions, we just need to study uh, men in general. But also, this goes beyond like women's specific conditions. So if you look at, for example, cardiovascular disease, uh, two-thirds of the patients are women. Uh, usually, we actually don't know, uh, know that. But if you look at the clinical trials and a lot of the research done in this space, most of the times, women are not either present, or if they are, it's just in a very small percentage. So we know very little about um, for the cardiovascular disease in women. And for example, if you go to the, to the doctor with um, a heart attack symptom, if it's a female doctor, uh, the, your chance of su survival increase 70%. So this just shows like, the lack of information, the lack of, um, of research there, uh, there is in this space. This is another interesting graph. This is actually focused on longevity. And as you can see, um, there's like more funding going to pets longevity than to reproductive health longevity. And uh, again, just shows like how a lot of the times uh, women are, or women's health research is actually overlooked and underfunded. But, and a lot of the times, like, of course, like, I'm, 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 I'm mentioning, like, the problem, but this is also a big opportunity, right? So the New York Times published this amazing article, I, I think, last year about menopause and how this is, like, a $600 billion opportunity. 10% of the women have um, uh, endometriosis. 10% of the women around the world have, endom uh, have PCOS, and there is no solutions. It takes a lot of the times, like, 7 to 10 years to get a diagnose, um, and then in the end, uh, they say, like, I oh, just have to deal with it. So there's like a big opportunity here. This is a big market. There's a big opportunity here. But so, for so many reasons, we are not seeing the research going into this uh, direction. And then the fact that there's a lack of research means that in the end, like, there are like, no treatments, no, uh, no diagnosis, and there's like a big miss there. And that's where we come in, right? So last year, uh, actually here in Berlin, um, we, a, a group of us, we went to this Berlin. We came together in a, in a room, and we realized that there's like a lot of areas in research that are overlooked and underfunded, and women's health research is one of the main ones. We realized that maybe using the bio model, uh, the bio DAO model, where as a, we organize as a, basically as a DAO, uh, as a biotech DAO, and we are able to address some of these uh, 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 focus these problems uh, would be a, a good way for us to do, to do that. So in our DAO, we basically we, we bring together researchers, women, community in general, funders, uh, advocates, and so on, people that have a are aligned with our mission of uh, changing the landscape of women's health and really want to make sure that we get, we, uh, we, we basically give more support to research in this field. And in the end, uh, the overall goal is to really make sure that we get more, uh, more as I was saying, better diagnosis and better treatments. 
So what have what have we done in the last few uh, few uh, few months? So we launched. So we started by launching a call for applications for ovarian, uh, ovarian aging. So we got 50 applications from all around the world, from some of the best universities around the world, and, and we basically we did we like we. we we look at the submissions. We find like a lot of great, uh, a, a, a great, um, a lot of great um, research, and we were able to find the first one. And we have two other in pipeline. So basically, what we are doing is use, using IP NFTs um, to, um, to basically to put on chain the research uh, agreements that we are doing with universities and research labs around the world. We were also able to raise, and this actually closed last week. We were also able to raise through a, a, a auction 360,000 USDC, so basically to direct to, to our mission. We are also like right now we have a call for submissions for endometriosis and PCOS. We really already got a lot of applications. We'll be going basically evaluating them over the next few months, and then uh, hopefully we'll be able to fund some of them um, and, and support this research uh, to one day, uh, hopefully, to get to market. And how we got here? I think part of our mission is, not, as I was mentioned, not only to support research in women's health space, but also onboard more women into the space. If you go around this conference, you don't see uh, a lot of women uh, uh, here, unfortunately. Um, and what we have been doing is through education, office hours, info sessions, community events uh, in person and online, we have been onboarding a lot of women into, uh, into the space. Um, and we, we were super excited to see like the, the, their support during our auction, but more, more than that, uh, their their day-to-day -day support as contributors, as uh, enthusiasts for, um, for women's health research and for what we are doing uh, in Web3. We also have like a lot of like something that we also have been doing a lot is also basically working with organizations that are already in space. She Fight, Boys Club, BFF and other organizations that has as mission onboard women into Web3. And we have been basically also working with them and be a bridge for, for, this, uh, for these organizations to decentralized science, right? Um, decentralized science is still a quite small uh, and new movement. Fortunately, it's growing uh, quite a lot. There are like more bio DAOs in the space, but, but not only let other, basically other organizations try or trying to really focus on the, some of the challenges of science. And what we are trying to do is like be a bridge to these organizations. It's very interesting to see that a lot of women come to us and say, like, oh, I look at the Tina Dao and look at the Tina Dao as a way for them to stay in Web3. There's like some people who are a little bit tired with some of the things that are happening in DeFi, for example. But, we are, but they are looking at decentralized science and, uh, and Tina Dao specifically as a way for them to stay engaged with Web3 and stay interested in, in um, in basically in doing work in this area. We also already published two pub uh, public goods with the help of, uh, of a Gitcoin grant. So the first reproductive health report focused on ovarian aging that was published last year in December. And the second one um, that was published this year about endometriosis and PCOS. I think if you look at the branding and like our like our, uh, the way we actually communicate at Tina Dao, um, we, we try to make sure that it's like very, let's call it consumer friendly, right? So we wanted to make sure that women could look at what we are doing and actually engage and be interested in what we are doing and stay a little bit away of some of, uh, some of, uh, some of the, t the ways Web3 sometimes communicates to, the, to this audience because it's, like, it's not appealing um, to women. So we wanted to make sure, and we were very inspired actually by fashion and beauty industries um, that have a very good way of communicating with women and we wanted to make sure that we could replicate that. So it was very intentional of, uh, 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 in our case to really create a brand uh, in uh, as a uh, basically a bio DAO with a, br a strong brand on um, that, that could ap appeal to to women. We also publish our uh, uh, white paper um, where we share like a little bit more about the problem of, of women's health research, but also like what's coming next for us, right? So what's like, what's the, what, what we want, or what our community wants uh, to happen in the next few months and years. Um, we know like, this is a multi-year uh, uh, multi pro uh, project or a challenge, um, and, but we all, I also know that in 10 years, I want the conversations to be different, right? I don't want to be talking about the same problems, the same, um, the, the same challenges that women face today. Uh, hopefully, we'll have solved some of them, and, and we'll be able to focus on specific areas that still probably will need um, 
support, but, but basically the, but the, those will be different. So far, what we have done is like, as I was mentioning, like we were able to, do, to have like one IP NFT focused on the ovarian aging. We have, uh, out of the 50 applications that we got, we have like six high caliber, caliber projects um, that went through senior review, and then right now are, we are basically are developing agreements with tech transfer offices or universities. We have 35 active contributors, more than 5,000 uh, members, and we have done, I think we, we put here 30, but I, I'm sure it's like more than 30 uh, talks, uh, events. Right now we actually have a series of uh, breakfast, a Tina Dow breakfast all around the world. Um, I think we had one yesterday in Singapore, two days ago we had one uh, in Nigeria, and next week we'll have one in Lisbon and another one in Nairobi. So we really want to make sure that the Tina Dow community is global and we are engaging men and women um, th that want to, 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 to join our community. As I was mentioning, we started with ovarian aging. Um, we are now focusing on endometriosis at PCOS. We decided the, to, because like women's health is such a big area, we decided to be every quarter to, to focus on a specific area. We started with ovarian aging, now endometriosis and PCOS, and um, in the next quarter we'll be focus, focusing on um, rare cancers. So what we want to make sure is that we are able to bring in the best researchers, the best projects, from, uh, research projects from around the world. We are able to bring also the best evaluators possible to really um, make sure that we, add, we are able to evaluate the project, but also we add value to the, to, um, to the researchers we are working with. As I was mentioning, we have, this is our first um, IPNFT uh, with Dr. Mario Cordero based in Spain, uh, focusing on ovarian aging. We have an another two coming up. Uh, this is from the uh, uh, from a university in the US, um, also a, a, with a, a, a different focus, but also with the, the, uh, in the area of ovarian aging. And uh, the uh, last one is another one, uh, another project. This from Singapore, from the uh, Brian Kennedy Lab. Uh, one of like the leading researchers in this space, and Lu Dong is um, a PhD student with a very interesting um, project that we'll be able to fund uh, uh, until the end of the year. In terms of core team, right? So we have we are four people. Some of us with experience with tech transfer or uh, support to un uh, entrepreneurs. Some others with experience more like on the branding, fashion, and building consumer goods. And then we have, of course, like Maria and Stefano, like scientists, PhDs with a very um, a, a very deep knowledge on the area of uh, of women's health. But of course, our community is bigger than that. We have uh, science contributors, we have legal, uh, Web3, R&D. So we bring a, a, like a very gro a diverse group of, of, of people from all around the world, different expertises that are able to add value to the, to the DAO. Our supporters, I won't go through them. But I think most of the, uh, what I want to make sure is like, of course, like for us, it's still day one, right? So we just, even though uh, Athena Dao was launched a year ago, uh, August last year, um, we have been like building this community of people that are engaged and interested in, in women's health. We know that the, the opportunity is there because, not only because of the, the, the research uh, project that we are receiving, because, but also because of the, the people that want to contribute to, the, to our mission. So that has been super, super exciting. But we, we want to make sure that uh, we can build from here. And also we believe that our focus going forward won't, will, won't be only focused on supporting research, but also building from there. We are, we are not 100% sure what the, uh, that will be. Right now, we are actually exploring different ways and engaging different uh, people and expert, uh, experts to really understand like, where Athena Dow can go from here. But there's, like, really, we really believe that the world is our oyster and there's a lot that we can do to support women's health. It, and as I was mentioning, it's still day one, so feel free to engage with us, join our Discord, and, uh, yeah, and now I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Inesh. So the floor is open for questions. Anyone? Ah. Uh, yeah, I just had questions on how do you like make it so that research in these uh, normal institutions are there's still like some selection process. It's not just about getting the funding for it. It's like 
who's allowed to make decisions on what can be researched. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously like this whole systemic patriarchy stuff. So how are you making sure that um, women's health actually gets researched here besides just the funding aspects? Yeah. So basically, what we are doing is to really reaching out to research centers all, all, all around the world that we know that are focusing on this area, and we are incentivizing them to apply to our uh, to basically our call for submissions. We also make sure that our um, our form for submissions is actually is like it's simple to 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 um, to fill in. It's like very straightforward. We are ask, asking the questions that we really need to uh, to know, and then we also make sure that we have a group of of um, of people that have a lot of experience, that have no conflicts of interest, and are able to get uh, basically evaluate the research the best way possible. We are not telling them what to research on. Um, basically, we are asking, we are just have, like looking around the world and trying to see who is researching on what. Of course, we are, we are doing that with a, with a focus, right? So we started with ovarian aging. Um, we are now focusing on endometriosis and PCOS, so we can close a little bit the scope. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sure like going forward, there will be other ways for us to do this, right? So I will, I, I'm sure that going forward, we'll be able to see like what is the white space, where can, how can we make sure that we map the landscape of women's health research and we are able to see in the white space and, go, and being a little bit like, and, and understand like uh, better who, who can research those, uh, those white spaces. But right now what we are trying to do is just make sure that we have, we, act, uh, we get to as much uh, researchers as possible from all around the world and we are able to then go, go through a process of evaluation of, uh, of that research. Someone had a question over here. OK, so it's been already answered. Anyone else? In that case, thank you once more, Inesh. Thank you very much. So this concludes our afternoon session. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We will now have a break until 4, so an hour-long break. I would like to ask you to leave the room for the duration of the break so that the technical people can do what they need to do. There's refreshments downstairs. Thank you so much.
final track of the day and for DAPCON here. I hope everyone has enjoyed themselves. To kick it off, we have Stefan Aldoff from Molecule DAO giving a talk about programmable IP. Um, give it up for Stefan. So, welcome everybody uh, to a talk that's called Programmable IP to Mitigate Human Suffering. My name is Stefan Adolf. I'm working for a company that's called Molecule. We're actually not a DAO. That was written a little bit wrong on that slide, but never mind. Um, we are powering DAOs and DAO ecosystems for biotech um, funded by Web3. So, the, the topic of... Um, Programmable IP starts with the main primitive of the molecule ecosystem, and that is the so-called IP NFT. I don't know if somebody of you uh, attended the talk that um, was taking place on this stage uh, around an hour before by Athena DAO. This is one of our bio DAOs, and they were actually emitting an IP NFT to capture intellectual property, but to answer the question, what's an IP NFT? Um, there are several aspects to it. Um, in a nutshell, technically, an IP NFT is nothing else than just a plain ERC721 uh, NFT, as you would imagine that. But on the other hand, what adds value to it is um, a combination of legal and smart contracts, right? So there are smart contracts behind that NFT, and there are legal uh, documents um, and contracts attached to it. On the other hand, um, what is an IP NFT actually doing? So IP stands for intellectual property, obviously. Um, it represents the future rights of that intellectual property while it's under, under, under development. So there are actually research projects in our case that say, I want to capture intellectual property on chain and sell that to other people or do, do things with it. We're going to see that in a second. Um, what IP NFTs are doing, they're binding legal agreements and ownership assignments to a transferable asset. That means you can prove on chain that you are the actual owner of the intellectual property bound to the NFT. Now, the really cool thing about them is you can use them as building blocks um, for other protocols, right? So you can actually, in the simplest case, you could try to sell them on OpenSea, which nobody's usually doing because they're quite valuable, but this is something you could do. You can fractionalize them, you could do whatever you want with them, actually. And most importantly, why are we building that? IP NFTs are used as in, uh, investment vehicles um, to found those or to fundraise for biotech research project, pro projects. And uh, you see a little selection of DAOs that, that um, already are considering or even have already minted IP NFTs, one of the most prominent ones being Vita DAO. I don't know if anybody of you heard about them, but this is actually the largest DAO we're currently supporting with an incubator program called BioXYZ. So this is um, more, more or less powered by us as Molecule, but we are mostly building the assets for that kind of stuff. So one thing about this talk, it is a rather technical because I'm the lead developer of the Molecule core developer team, and um, it's maybe not as um, uh, philosophical as Benji would have presented that, who was actually talking this talk slot in the first place. So bear with me if you see some code or some JSON files during uh, the upcoming 10 minutes. What we wanted to show you is how the IPNFT minting process itself looks under the hood. Now, if you're not a developer, but if you're interested in uh, figuring out how this kind of stuff works, you don't have to understand anything. You can just go to our interface at testnet.mint.molecule.to and mint it on your own. We spent hours and hours and hours in making this foolproof. I guess everybody should more or less uh, be able to, to use that interface to mint an IPNFT. So, the first thing you do when you want to mint an IPNFT is you need to get the number of the IP NFT you want to mint. And this is a very special reason. All the legal documents you're going to uh, attach to it will refer to the ID you're going to create in the first step. And this is a process that has been permissioned before, and it's now completely permissionless. So you can just go to our smart contract, call the reserve method, which is absolutely public, and create a new IP NFT ID and use that one um, uh, to refer to, to the intellectual property later on. Now, each IPNFT comes with a certain 
uh, structure of metadata attached to it. This is what I was talking before. On the very right hand side, um, you're gonna you, you see a sample of how this metadata looks like under the hood. But um, the preview here in the middle is actually how it looks like on screen. And I attached lots of little pills explaining what's what's going on there or what you're gonna have to put onto it, right? Maybe one uh, some of the most important things are definitely who is researching on that, who's the lead res researcher of the project, which institution maybe a university um, has uh, enabled that research in the first place, and um, a list of attachments that are going to be attached um, on that IPNFT in, in, in the background. Now, after you got your um, IPNFT ID reservation, you can start crafting legal documents around that. If you go to our website and use our official minting front end, you are able um, to, to, to do this on the website itself. So we have some templates for you where you can create those research, so those, those legal agreements um, automatically. But if you are a researcher and you know a little bit what you're doing, you will craft them on your own. So the first kind of agreement you're going to attach to an IPNFT is the so-called research agreement, and there are different flavors of them, actually. The most currently prominent one is the sponsored research agreement, but we crafted something that's very unique to IPNFTs called the SAFIP. This is what our legal um, department was actually crafting. And those actually talk about what's going on in the research project itself. And this might not be to be disclosed to the public. This is usually um, confidential information. This is why you actually want to encrypt that later on. I'm going to show you that in a second. But the second agreement you're going to prepare is a so-called assignment agreement. And this template is also absolutely open source. You can just use the stuff we are, um, have prepared there. The assignment agreement is assigning the real-world um, intellectual property to the current owner of the IP NFT with the ID that you have reserved. You can actually, if you do this on a technical level, not on our front end at the moment, you can attach whatever you want. So if there are more um, legal documents that you want to attach to it, this is the place um, to collect them. Now, the first thing you want to do technically is, and this is what you don't see on the front end, obviously, you want to check some all those documents because they're going to be referred to on chain if, if somebody's downloading them in the, in, uh, later on. They want to prove that all those documents were the ones that have been attached while the app NFT has been minted. This is more or less how it looks like under the hood. You can, If you want, you can use any kind of checksum algorithm. We're using SHA-2 or the, it's not, not really Kachak, but it's the SHA-2 algorithm that is um, also that's delivered by uh, IPFS. So this is code we prepared. We have sample repos on it. I'm going to link to uh, point to them in the very end of the slide deck. Uh, you can download them. You can try them out. You can try this on your own. Now, once you have checksumed them, you want to, as I said, encrypt certain documents because they potentially carry information that's not supposed to be disclosed to the public, particularly the research agreement. And there's a protocol, and I'm pretty, pretty, pretty aware that, that many of you might know that already, it's called LIT, which is allowing you to encrypt things in, in a, or to, to store encrypted values in a decentralized way. And this is exactly what we're using to encrypt that part of the IP NFT. So you as a developer, if you are one, you can use um, the procedure that we uh, also have on our sample repos and encrypt the, um, the research agreement with a key that's then also encrypted and the, um, the, the, um, the clear text key is only going to be reassembled on client side. That means only people who are supposed to read the data will be able to reassemble that encrypted key on their machine. It's a peer-to-peer -peer protocol. I don't want to give a talk about lit protocol, but it seems kind of safe. They're, gonna, they're on, a, on, a, on a clear path of decentralization. Many people's using that, and uh, this is what we're also using for IP NFTs. Now, once you went through the process and uh, encrypted that research agreement and got that uh, encrypted um, symmetric key, you're going to put that down for the, for, for the minute and uh, also keep the encrypted file somewhere. And you keep something that's called access control conditions. This is actually defining which, on, under which um, conditions somebody may decrypt the uh, IP NFT attached data later on. We're going to see, uh, I guess, a sample of that in a second. This is more or less how it looks like. The encrypted symmetric key that comes out of the lib protocol is actually just a binary string somehow. You can just put it in the metadata of the IP NFT. And the access control conditions is something that lib protocol provides as a structure. This is, as I said, just explaining um, or it's, it's defining which kind of chain condition has to be there so the caller of, um, 
of the Lit Protocol API may receive the key shards that will enable the, um, reassembling the, the uh, encryption key on their machine to finally decrypt the data. And if this is a little bit too much for you, you can imagine it like, if you hold the IPNFT ID, you can ask Lit Protocol to please provide the symmetric key to, to decrypt the attachments, and they will do so because you hold it. If you don't hold it, they will not give you the, uh, these, the, the shards of that, of that private key, which is pretty interesting. Method, uh, method. Now, one of the final steps is now you have to you have to store that kind of stuff somewhere, right? So what we are doing, and I mean everybody else is doing this too as well, you upload the data to some decentralized file system. I don't know what we prefer is IPFS and particularly Web3 Storage, delivered by our friends of Protocol Labs, which is an awesome service to just well fire and forget. You can upload things. They are they are they are actually pinning them automatically. They are even queuing them to to uh, Filecoin storage. So this is this is a rather decent service to to store data. And we are storing the images, the encrypted metadata, the metadata, and the final metadata using that method. It all ends up with um, data that's stored on IPFS. And uh, what you're supposed to do, you can, you can actually add those links that come out of that service in your IPNFT metadata. One of the last steps here is we want to be legally compliant. And that means that when you mint the IPNFT, you actually agree to the terms behind that. Those are the terms and conditions you can find on our website. You can copy paste them to your service if you want to write it on your own. But this is not a sample. This is exactly the string that's supposed to be signed. And if you look closely, the attachments of the IP NFT are mentioned here. So those agreements are to be signed by the party that's minting the IP NFT. At the bottom, this is something you very likely might know. This is like a binary signature um, that was derived by um, the, the signing party that was uh, supposed to mint the IP NFT. And you take that one down. Now, you add the met th this, this term signature to the metadata, and now you upload this final metadata structure to some final location. And now it comes to the final step. If you want to build a meaningful protocol in Web3, and the data itself is actually the value, you want to ensure that the data follows a certain structure. Otherwise, nobody else might be able to read that. How do you overcome that? So Ceramic has some answers to that. There are lots of other protocols that might solve that. But how do you, do that? How do you enforce that on chain? It's not that simple. And what we are doing, we actually added um, a, per a permission step in the very end. We are signing off your metadata. So if you want to mint an IPNFT, there is a little unfortunate step in the end where we are checking if your metadata is actually compliant to the IPNFT metadata standard, which is just an adjacent, uh, adjacent schema. So this is what our service is doing. It's also checking whether you really have accepted the terms that I was shown the slide before. And uh, it's also checking something about the images, but I won't disclose what is actually checking there. So we are making sure more or less that the stuff you're minting is more or less really looking like an IPNFT. Once we are pretty sure that this, this is a good uh, data structure, we are signing off a message for you that we are sending you. This is what you see on the, on the right hand side at the bottom. And now finally, you can call the mint reservation function on our smart contract that finally will mint the IPNFT. And if you look closely at those parameters, the last one's called authorization. This is what's actually what came out of the step before. So this is the authorization we gave you to mint that IPNFT on our contract. This is to be made to avoid spam, and it's made to ensure that the metadata structure is correct. One little side note, you also have to bring 0.001 Ether, which is our so-called symbolic minting fee, AKA um, spam protection. <laughs> so you cannot just mint as many IPNFTs as you want. You always have to pay a little fee. So we can be pretty sure you're not putting lots of useless stuff on that. You can actually, but you pay for it. This is what you will end up with. This is how it looks like when you look at an IPNFT on our website, but this is just how we are displaying that. Everybody could just use them, display in any way they want and utilize them however they want. There is actually um, a pounds value written on this one. This is actually Validao's first IPNFT that they minted some weeks ago. This, dollar, this pound value over there is not the price on chain. This is the initial amount that has been funded by a DAO that was buying that IPNFT when it was minted. This is not automatical. This is actually only metadata. Somebody put that value on and said, OK, I was granted like 228,000 pounds to, to, to start my research on that intellectual property. And now, now you have an IPNFT. So what? <laughs> you have 
a representation of intellectual property on chain. What could you do with that? One very obvious thing is you can fractionalize that. And I was told I shouldn't mention the term fractionalization because it implies certain things. This is why we call it tokenize. So what we're doing, we're tokenizing a token. We're tokenizing the IPNFT to a fungible token contract, which we are creating as a minimal proxy on chain. You as an IPNFT holder can just call that method. You can also use our very beautiful interface here to mint, I don't know, a million, you come up with a number, 10 million um, um, IPTs of that IPNFT. That rep will represent uh, membership and governance rights over the development of the, intellectual pro of the underlying intellectual property. So if you are distributing that IPT token to your, I don't know, community, to all the people interested in that um, kind of research, they can participate actively in the development of that research project. This is the whole idea. And many people are actually very much ready to pay money to gain access to those IP tokens because they might come with lots of little benefits if you're interested in the research project, right? So if you say, I want to support that Validal people and the researcher behind it, I'm ready to pay, I don't know, 10,000 pounds just to have access to the token, which might entitle me to gain more access on data that comes out of the project. So nobody has to really own the IPNFT itself. This is just the base asset that might be sold one day to a huge pharmacy company, but the IPT is already entitling you to actually... Um, get access to certain kinds of data that's attached to the IPNFT. That's out of, of molecule scope at the moment. We don't really care what, how they're utilizing that. We're just enabling the Web3 assets or the Web3 Web asset classes for projects to utilize it. Um, this is a sample how it looks like when you're actually selling off those IPTs to your community. We built a, a crowd sale contract in the middle of uh, 2023 extremely successfully, we built that. In, uh, so it's super generic. You can use that crowd sale contract for any kind of your community. I don't know if somebody of you maybe even have followed that up. So um, VidaDAO was fractionalizing or synthesizing or tokenizing the IPNFT um, from Viktor Korolchak, which was dealing with um, a research topic that I cannot explain because I'm a, I'm a mathematician. I don't know anything about chemistry, but um, uh, this is awesome research actually. And they were selling off a tiny amount, like 25, uh, sorry, 25,000 uh, 25, tokens for a certain um, of, um, funding goal. So this was um, a public crowd sale. Everybody could, could um, take part in it. There were some little tweaks on it, but uh, what we figured out in the end, it was like oversold by 1,700%. So people were actually really after that one. Why did they do that? Because now the owners of those IPT tokens are members of the snapshot voting uh, of the snapshot community that you see on the right hand side, and they actually start interacting with the research project directly. So they have some impact on what Viktor Korolchak and his team is going to develop in the future. Um, some other things you can do with uh, IP NFTs. You can actually token gate other, other services. You can check whether somebody holds an IPT and uh, disclose data for them. Um, there is actually a feature that, that we are providing which is called a public data room. So you can attach just public data. You can, I don't know, add lots of findings that you have as, as a researcher or stuff that's interesting for your investors um, and upload that. And if you want, you can just token gate it in a way that only certain people, maybe IPT holders with a certain amount of IPTs on their wallet, may see the data. In a nutshell, IP, IPNFTs, this is what you already guessed, are able um, to build, to, 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 to build on-chain intellectual property portfolios for those bio DAOs that we are supporting by other means. And this is uh, just a screenshot of what, what VitaDAO is presenting on their website. So they are actually, and I don't have the numbers in my mind, this is maybe what Vincent comes up with in, in some minutes. They are um, collecting intellectual property or they're adding this to their portfolio, thereby growing the amount of, of, um, of um, investment volume that they have bound into their, into their DAO ecosystem, thereby raising the value of the overall ecosystem that they are building. And Vida DAO is, is actually, if you don't know them, ca taking care of longevity research in general. Some other things without screenshots, what you can do is, this is really interesting stuff actually, 
you can nobody really knows if, if 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 a newly existing research project is really that valuable as they claim because you don't know the output. They are still researching, right? So how do you know if this is valuable? One thing that might tell you if something's valuable is if you expose it to the market. You say, well, you can buy shares of that. Not really shares, but you can buy actually. You could put money into it. If nobody puts money into it, it very likely isn't that valuable, right? But if people are putting money into it, well, it's an indicator that this is really valuable, and this is something you. Can do with IPTs. You can figure out a little bit if people are ready to pay money for it, then it might have more value than other projects. And as I said, governance plays a major role here. You can have other shareholders or stakeholders of the um, longevity um, ecosystem, for example, have a saying in what happens next, what research area somebody should focus on, if you wouldn't, if, if you should raise more funds for the research projects, and so on. So it's actually more or less a governance membership thing. That's everything that I have on my slides. I put quite a lot of, uh, no, uh, three links at the bottom that might be valuable for, for you. So the documentation area, the minting um, front end that I was mentioning and showing, and of course our website, which we remade two weeks ago by our very awesome website team. And you're going to find me anywhere on Web3, also on a service called X. And uh, don't forget to buy my friend's token. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan, for a great talk. We have a few minutes for some questions. Otherwise, I can also answer my own questions, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's always useful. Absolutely. Yeah. If the audience isn't that great, isn't that large, I happily ask my own questions. But feel free. So if somebody of you has anything that comes up to your mind, ask, ask me anything. If not, uh, you can find Stefan here uh, right at the conference. and. Uh, We'll have a five-minute break, all right? Sorry. Thank, Thank you very you much, so much Stefan. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Welcome back. So, uh, unfortunately, our original speaker, uh, Paul Kohlhaas, wasn't able to make it today. But we have someone just as brilliant. It's Vincent Weiser for Molecule. And he'll be talking about liquid singularity, how DSI, IP NFTs, and bio DAOs will reinvent our medical system. So everyone give a big round of applause for Vincent Weiser. Thank you very much. Um, so excited to talk to you about uh, DSI today and kind of give a broad level overview for what decentralized science is, uh, why we need DSI, and how it works. Um, I, th I recognize, of course, many familiar faces also in the audience. So I'm curious by a show of hands, like who of you is already quite familiar with decentralized science and knows of organizations like VitaDAO? OK, so almost everyone. Um, so I'll try to jump into uh, some depth. So I'll start with kind of like um, why DSI and why we need DSI, what it also sets out to um, solve, and then what it looks like in practice, um, how it works in practice, and kind of some hopes for the future. So I always like to start off with this graph of kind of um, science as the engine of human progress. And I think it's worth emphasizing that I think um, our modern world and like well-being is largely due to scientific progress. And of course, also more broadly, technological um, engineering uh, progress. Um, from the agricultural revolution to kind of like the industrial revolution. And of course, really just like different breakthroughs in the scientific method. Um, and really broadly applying it and translating science into actual inventions that benefit all of us. But I think it's also um, very broken, and I think um, there's a whole field called uh, meta science, which actually is like the science of science, which is quite interesting, trying to use the scientific process to understand what's broken about science. Um, and there's a lot of lessons there, but it's a theoretical, so they don't apply the lessons. It's more like scientists trying to ramble about how science is broken, not really able to, do, to change anything about it because they are not the funding bodies, they are not the coordination mechanisms, they're just a set of academics trying to reflect on how academia is broken. Um, and I think I view decentralized science almost as an applied um, meta-science, what means we can use the insights that this field has about how scientific funding, replication, competition, communication, and a bunch of other central pillars of science are broken, and how could we could devise solutions. And I think, importantly, like, this is quite new, so I think we are uh, just getting started to experiment with some potential solutions. I think, ideally, um, the, the really big solutions, I think, are, are still ahead of us. And uh, I would invite all of you to participate in finding the solutions and helping to come up with these experiments, um, and then learning and do iterated cycles of improvement to ultimately make science better. Um, so to just jump into some of the problems on, on funding, they are also widely known. Like Funding is, is very uh, insanely centralized. So there's big funding bodies in the uh, US, like the NIH, and they are one of the major funders of, of science. There are a few small um, philanthropic arms, and of course, venture capital, for example, for later stages. But uh, at the end, like especially for early stage science, it's usually top-down, bureaucratic, government entities funding um, early um, science. I think it's actually more functional, for example, for startups, where it's like a free market, VC world. Um, so funding is highly competitive. And very also like distributed, for example, towards um, repeatedly the same people and, and old people. So there's like an interesting statistic that less than 2% of the funding goes to under 45-year-olds, which really means that like a lot of the funding goes to uh, usually like uh, quite old professors and people with tenure. Um, and then, of course, also widely known, um, science has a huge replication problem. For example, there was like an Alzheimer's um, uh, study recently that got debunked, and it turned out that people faked uh, signs on which 
tens of billions of Alzheimer research have been built on. Basically, you can throw all this taxpayer's money into the bin because none of this research will work because someone in the chain uh, created fake science that didn't replicate, which means it couldn't be reproduced, it, it didn't uh, work at the end, which was the um, kind of like Al Alzheimer hypothesis. Um, and then on competition, it, it's very hyper-competitive and not even in a good way. I, for example, think like maybe the free enterprise VC world is also hyper-competitive, but uh, maybe in a more functional way. I think in science, it's a very zero-sum, like uh, underpaid kind of competition um, with perverse incentives like uh, publish or perish, like just getting a, as many citations as possible, like almost like playing a game that you can't win because you're optimizing for the wrong thing. And connected to that, I think, uh, all these publications then are paywalled and no one even can read them. Uh, so, like really on the communication side, science is very inaccessible, which is very weird if you consider that all of you fund science through your taxes, uh, but you can't even read the, the science you funded. Um, so I think that's also something crypto can solve. And then also science could um, just be forgotten in, in, in a sense where I think things, for example, like decentralized storage um, promise permanently stored science. Like ideally every scientific artifact, every scientific data point should be backed up on as many computers as possible so we don't lose it. A lot of some of the most important research in the world just gets lost. Like maybe you still have the paper, but you have no clue how they actually did the research. You couldn't replicate it. So um, I think permanent storage of uh, scientific data and research is also quite important. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of the problems stem from centralizing authorities. I think decentralization offers solutions. I think there's also a lot of problems beyond just like the centralization, decentralization axes. Uh, but I think uh, actually there are interesting ones that come from, from that. And then I think um, to break it down maybe in the why, what, and how, kind of like the why of these I would say is to uh, build an uh, open science m movement, apply the lessons from meta science, make science more collaborative and democratic. Like ultimately less than 0.01% of the world is involved in science if you think about it uh, directly. Like there's very few scientists compared to humans in the world. And very um, many people are not able to get involved in science. Like, there's a huge barrier to entry in terms of like you need a PhD. It's even almost like um, gate capped, like a club that you can only get in if you have a PhD or if you have a lot of money and are a billionaire philanthropist or something. Like most regular people are not involved in science. They can't access it. They can't read it. They can't find, fund it. They can't participate in it. Um, and I think that is something which decentralized science can solve. So the what I view as almost like a global open alternative to the current scientific system that anyone in the world can participate in. Um, and then how? Really by enabling scientists to raise funding from everyone in the world, run experiments, share data, distribute insights, and for everyone in the world to participate actively in the scientific process through scientific communities that I'll touch later on. Um, so what if science is decentralized? And I think what's interesting is in the ethos of decentralization, it shares a lot of things, I think, with um, potential solutions for science, mainly ethos of decentralization, open source, transparency, um, really an ethos of enabling global access and collaboration, no matter your language or your education, um, censorship resistance that fosters an open culture, which I think is also very key to science. Like literally in many countries, I won't name them, but you, you can't... Uh, uh, publish research that is critical to the regime or to the to the country. Like COVID is a great example. Like if, if you look at some big places that go unnamed, uh, you couldn't publish COVID research uh, that would challenge uh, specific assumptions. And as mentioned before, like permanent storage of scientific data, I think is also quite ki critical. So I just um, on a side by side comparison, you can also find it on Ethereum.org/dsci. Uh, I'm kind kind of trying to compare TradSci to DSI. Um, and of course, there's the axis of, of funding, collaboration, labs and infrastructure, publishing, peer review, and IP. And in the decentralized system, um, all of that is better and solved, of course. Um, and I'm go I'll go into some depth of some examples on how this looks like in practice. So there are some verticals that I want to focus on. Uh, the first one is funding. 
um, where Stefan already touched on IP NFTs and tokens, which is the very first almost prototype experiment. I think there's still a lot to um, refine and improve there to make it the perfect funding mechanism, but I think it already shows the way. Uh, there's, of course, a lot of public goods funding mechanisms, some of which we're also involved with. In. Um, and uh, then on the coordination layers, we have biotech DAOs, kind of like scientific collectives like VitaDAO, that really bring together a large group of people to coordinate, which I think really helps because a lot of people have the desire maybe to fund longevity research or climate research, but they don't have the time to figure out what to fund. Um, or maybe they just want have the desire to go to a community to learn about science, to discuss science, and that's really, I think, the point of these native online communities uh, of scientific DAOs. Uh, then there's a whole vertical of publishing and reproducibility and identity and reputation, and also a bunch of other verticals, a few examples which I will pick. Um, with Molecule, we are focused on uh, making IP transactable specifically, and enabling sustainable funding loops for research organizations where they can fund research and license the research, make money with the research to fund more research. Um, there's a lot of challenges in IP. Um, because I don't have too much time, I, I, I'll skip a bit ahead, but on, into some of the solutions. <laughs> um, the goal is really to make um, intellectual property uh, digital native and kind of fix some of the problems by really making it uh, more discoverable, uh, making it more liquid, and enabling people to fund research directly, um, and, and doing so by bringing it on chain, which also enables then uh, scientific DAOs like VitaDAO to fund research natively through a digital way. Um, this is what like the Molecule Marketplace looks like. Um, I'll skip a bit ahead because Stefan touched on some of the architecture. So one of the newer things we did which this um, visualizes well is really, which is at the heart on the more like crypto side of things, is um, a DIP NFT, which is basically a one of one. It's like a one research project. And what you can do is tokenize it and split it into infinitely many parts. And that basically turns an IP NFT into many IP tokens. It's fundamentally still the same thing, but like uh, we, uh, so the whole audience, could collectively through IP tokens own one IP NFT. Um, of course, you can also govern it through a BioDAO, for example. Um, so the purpose is really to get individual stakeholders into research projects. You could imagine that the researcher has some IP tokens, the community has some IP tokens, and the individuals that are really excited about a specific research project could also uh, fund or earn tokens for their work. And um, yeah, maybe to just go. So, yeah. Um, and we've basically done this with Vita Fast, which is the first um, IP token. And then I want to touch on why biodars in this uh, picture are also quite important. I think at the heart, it's really enabling kind of like an internet native community of um, patients, patients and enthusiasts. Like an example of Vita Dao, um, of course, everyone is a patient of age related diseases like Alzheimer's and cancer at some point. Um, hopefully not. But, uh, I think thus far, like everything points to uh, everyone being a patient of age-related diseases. And, and then really the goal is, of course, not everyone in the world cares, for example, about age-related diseases. So the goal is really to bring together also enthusiasts and researchers in an online native community, no matter the border or country. And it's very cool to see like, that like, it's actually not just like the um, speak, but actually, you, like in VitaDAO, I've met people like, literally doing longevity research in like, Turkey, Kazakhstan, across the US, America, Asia. And I think that's quite hard in a traditional system, where it's oftentimes quite local. It's like people in Boston at Harvard doing research with other people at Harvard. Um, it's not very global. And it's, also very physical, it's not digital and native, and thus also creates high barrier to entry, because most people in the world don't sit in Harvard, they sit somewhere in the world. Um, so it's really, truly internet-first uh, research organizations that are truly open and networked. There's a really great book on this uh, by Michael Nielsen called Networked Science, kind of painting the picture why this is superior. I think with examples like Wikipedia even, we, we see great examples of like open, online uh, native digital organizations being uh, quite superior to physical closed uh, organizations. 
So, VitaDAO, I've touched on it. Um, I'll jump into some of the projects and examples what VitaDAO has been doing on the publishing, uh, on the funding side, publishing side, and even longevity network state side and a bunch of other experiments. So this is an overview of uh, how the current um, research flow works for VitaDAO. So basically, research applies um, if they qualify, like there are specific, basically, uh, considerations. Um, then there's a due diligence by, uh, an, by an evaluation team of experienced people um, in the DAO that basically take a look and due diligence the research. Uh, the team presents to the community with the community basically then has also the evaluations from the experts. So it's also a nice way for scientific communication because the whole community um, like a lot of them might not be PhDs, but they can learn about why the research could be interesting. And here also from an independent evaluator, what the um, pros and cons are and some of the evaluations. And then with this ex expert review taken in, the, uh, the experts make a recommendation to the community. But at the end, the community decides. Um, and the community, of course, is composed of researchers, uh, but also just of enthusiasts and people curious to understand which research is most promising. And then at the end, if at least 51% vote yes, the research is funded and advanced. Um, so VitaDAO funded over 5 million of, of research to date. I think roughly 19 projects, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and some of them are making amazing progress, and you can see all of them on, on VitaDAO.com. Um, what I think is interesting to highlight and less often talked about is now also experiments on all the other verticals that I mentioned. So, for example, VitaDAO uh, created Longevist, which is a journal, but quite nicely it um, also summarizes the papers. It, they are uh, reviewed and selected by some of the leading researchers in the world, to be honest, which is, was pretty amazing to see. And all of them are open and accessible. And Actually, they're also on-chain stored through collaboration with DSA Labs and peer-reviewed through Longevity Review, which is kind of like a Reddit online forum for peer review, where actually peer review happens openly. Uh, peer reviewers are compensated, both of which is not the case in the traditional peer review system. Like, you're in, like it doesn't, it's not happening openly, so sometimes scientists competing with each other, uh, reviewing each other um, and in a very intransparent way and not even compensated. Um, so I think that's an exciting uh, experiment on, on publishing by VitaDAO. And they already have the second edition. And to be honest, like I've, it's, it's uh, one of the first uh, ways for me now to keep in touch with some of the leading research coming up because they really select also some of, for some of the most promising research and vote on it on-chain through Snapshot. Then VitaDAO, um, we, we experiment with network states, which of course uh, through Balaji and others got popular and actually really closely teamed up with Vitalik and many others to uh, a two months long pop-up city in Montenegro. They kind of like want to give us like a long-term uh, place now. And, and the idea is really to bring together longevity uh, enthusiasts and communities in physical locations. And we literally discussed with the like Montenegrin government to uh, like declare aging a disease, bring in like, um, kind of like research labs and, and support from the government to create a longevity hub there. So it's really exciting to see. There's actually coming up early next year in Prospera, which is in Honduras, uh, one of the first kind of charter city network states. There's a two months long uh, longevity experiment and city. And a lot of actually the leading network states, uh, some of which have already have physical places secured, are keen to collaborate with VitaDAO on the healthcare system. So basically, they want to consult VitaDAO, build like a longevity first little pop-up city, and, and really also tap into all the community members to uh, visit their city, access like cutting edge uh, research. And in the Prosper example, it's interesting, they actually uh, have a medical free zone. So they actually have, um, for example, longevity clinics that can do gene therapies that you can't do in the US or Europe which is, of course, also more risky, so uh, don't try at home. Um, and then there's a few other experiments which I think are interesting to highlight, uh, which kind of naturally came out of, of VitaDAO, and I was also quite involved in. Like One was a quadratic donation round, which you can see on the right with VitaDAO, where, for example, Vitalik put in half a million, uh, and a bunch of other community members. Actually, a shout-out also to Stefan from 
uh, Gnosis, who also put in uh, money with Vitalik. Um, and, and that funded a lot of different experiments from literally open research to uh, open scientific platforms in, in longevity to, for example, also the student fellowship that we started, which funded 55 students to a longevity prize, which uh, awarded the first prizes to different people solving different problems and longevity, and also funded things like a VitaDAO hackathon, which is like an online hackathon for people to hack a weekend on solving important problems and longevity. Um, okay, I touched on this. I want to end on a bit of a future outlook. So we're just getting started, kind of like, I would say these have really only existed since 2021. So it's like barely two years old. I, of course, there was some similar movements before, like blockchain for science, I think in, in 2018 a bit, but that really died down. I think Molecule is the only survivor of that era, like because it already started in 2018 a bit. Um, so I want to touch on some of the future of, of DSI. I think one interesting one is really that I, I think the future is quickly moving to digital native AI-driven closed-loop R&D, and I'll uh, bottleneck it, uh, uh, unpack it, that what I mean by it, It's basically, uh, you know, of course, ChatGPT and other things, and they increasingly will be able to uh, come up with scientific experiments, potentially even execute them through Cloud Labs, evaluate the results, and, or for example, in VitaDAO's case, to find deal flow, to evaluate deal flow, to make progress on research. And I think actually like an autonomous, decentralized system is perfect as a playground in that, while not completely disenfranchising humans. So you can still see maybe the AI making a proposal to the DAO. Maybe uh, even some AIs already vote on the proposals or execute the research. And I think that will be very interesting. And um, with organizations like LabDAO, we're starting to do some also AI-driven drug discovery with um, VitaDAO natively, actually through on-chain native um, mechanisms. Then really in broadly kind of DSI upgrading the scientific method and stack. That I touched on before, like really continuously uh, looking at problems, devising solutions, figuring out if it actually solved the problem, and coming up with better experiments. So I think, uh, of course, not just our effort, but every effort in DSI, I think, is trying to improve a specific problem. Um, I think the, uh, increasingly it will create like a truly global, autonomous, and decentralized R&D world where everyone in the world can contribute. Um, which touches on this, <laughs> enabling every human to be a scientist and participate in science, um, enabling patient and researcher communities to govern cures and access to medications, like uh, diabetic, um, governing diabetic medicine, and thus also the pricing and other uh, aspects. Then making kind of like science as easy as using an, a website, like ideally one can log in and uh, learn about science, give feedback about specific research, and I think that's really the future we're trying to build. Then making sure that also scientists are fairly paid and incentivized for the work, also in asymmetric ways. Like if someone in a DAO like helps to come up with a cure for like a big disease uh, in their free time, like they should get rewarded for it. In the current scientific system, like a lot of even leading scientists and, and senior scientists get sometimes less than like an intern in a blockchain startup. So I think that is also something that needs to be solved. Um, like raising, of course, the scientist's salary, not decreasing the interns. Um, and then really making sure that science decouples from institutions, so c c uh, creating like an alternative to um, existing scientific institutions that are often gate-kept and um, yeah, very hard to access. And then as a last call to action, uh, feel free to check out some of the pages or like projects that I mentioned, and jo just join a community. It's as easy as just going into the Discord, checking out the website, and seeing if there's something that you're excited about. Um, feel free also, of course, if you're a scientist, apply to get funded. There's also things like the fellowships and other things where you can also just get a funding for a little hackathon or, or some small project. And then make sure to fund a DAO of your interest or research project, um, or get rewarded for a referring research project. Uh, so thank you very much, and join the DSA revolution. <laughs> and you can scan this QR code, which basically has a link tree of, of every uh, resource I mentioned. Okay, thank you, Vincent. That was uh, very insightful. Uh, Unfortunately, we're running short on time, so um, if you have any further questions, please visit Vincent on the ground floor, and I'm sure he'll be happy to 
discuss with you guys. Um, so yeah, uh, up next, we have uh, Lewis Betzenberger from Shutter Network, uh, and he'll be talking about the five principles to kickstart a sustainable market architecture paradigm for DeFi. So everyone give a warm welcome to Lewis. Hello, <laughs> this is work? Yes, cool. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so I'll, um, I'm Luis from Shadow Network, um, which is a MEV protection mechanism using um, threshold encryption. Um, but this talk will be a little more broader and sort of connecting what we're working on kind of in practice, but connecting this to the more, to the broader overarching sort of, um, yeah, wh wh why are we doing this and why, wh a little bit of what, what's, what I think is going wrong and how can we maybe address it and, and how does it connect to other things. Um, so a little bit, little bit broad, but um, it'll, it'll also connect it to the more um, concrete things as well. Um, so yeah, I think um, this is kind of the overarching term. I kind of was, was a, I, I stole from uh, actually the traditional finance um, world where they, after the uh, 08 financial crisis, they had a similar, they had this, these problems with, uh, they would say that the market architecture is unsustainable and you know Ponzi's and all these real estate um, derivatives things. And they said, we need to change something. We need to sort of um, create a better um, architecture right? and ha have policy and things that, that um, improve it. And I stole this sort of term and said, maybe we need something similar for, uh, for crypto, right? Um, so wh why am I saying this? I think. So from the outside, the mainstream regulator, regulators are looking at crypto and they are fundamentally perceiving it as, as unsustainable. And this is a bunch of different things. So from the outside, people are saying it's all Ponzi's, um, it's unsustainable sort of self-referential um, revenue models. Um, I would say sort of regulation. So some people would say there's not enough regulation. Maybe some other people would say there's um, too much regulation, but clearly this is sort of like out of sync. Um, and then for our specific sort of what we are working on, we also think that the transaction supply chain is in a, in a pretty bad state. Um, briefly on this, right, because this is what we're working on, is yeah, front running um, and malicious MEV uh, causes immense user losses. Um, more importantly, we think it um, deters mainstream um, and serious investors from enter even entering crypto. And it, in the way we are dealing with it, the way we're trying to fix it, and indirectly creates these centralization and censorship um, vectors in the transaction and MEV supply chain. Um, one example of this is um, something that Martin uh, from Gnosis is saying, and some, some other people, I think SMG um, also like displayed this a little bit, that it's actually now cheaper to censor um, uh, on Ethereum with PBS than it was before. So we are fixing some problems with the, with the way we're dealing with MEV currently, but we're also sort of creating these longer term um, dangers or these censorship um, vectors. Um, and yeah, again, connecting it to the bigger picture by having this hostile sort of transaction supply chain environment, how it is right now, I think we're also just lowering accessibility and we're sort of favoring those very sophisticated trader type of people who can still make money, but everyone else is sort of like left out, right? So it's an accessibility issue as well. Um, um, I'm sure you guys, everyone should be familiar, generally speaking, or just reminding you, so front running, what is front running and how does it relate to malicious MEV? Front running is basically just jumping the queue. So there's a queue in front of the exchange, essentially. People are lining up to, to place orders. And, um, and front running means you're somehow sort of jumping the queue and stealing someone else's order, essentially. In the real world, the, the, at least a certain subset of this is illegal. So especially the ones that are sort of relating to insider information. That's illegal, actually. Um, in crypto, usually people are definitely considering as being pretty harmful. Um, and um, yeah, sort of, there is also non-malicious MEV. So it's a subset of MEV, and there's a, the, which is malicious, and the other subset of it, um, so if the generalized arbitrage and liquidations are usually considered to, to not be um, harmful. Um, and what's the overall impact of this? We think is sort of, again, I think it's in the beginning, mainstream regulators are really fed up with crypto. Like, you every time I'm listening to sort of tech 
podcast, non-crypto tech podcast. People are laughing about it, and then if you hear about, if you hear regulators talk about crypto, they um, are also not really uh, looking not very favorable up upon it. Um, they think it's host hostile again, sort of it's inaccessible um, in its current state to most, and and because of this, I think we're missing out a lot of, on a lot of business. Right? If we can include, uh, we can improve accessibility. Um, and and, and uh, sustainability of it, I think we could actually draw a lot more mainstream um, user, users to it. Yeah? So this is what I'm saying. Like we could, like one idea could be rally around this sort of new paradigm of sustainable market architecture, which is a very broad term, trying to like split it up and say what what could be some of these principles. Um, and my five principles that I came up with for now uh, would be baseline neutrality. Accessibility, sustainable, sustainable revenue models, sensible regulation, and privacy. Um, so I think if we pr improve these, I think we can we can um, have a better outcome. Eh? I'm sorry for the sort of sat sat satanistic um, pentagram, but what I'm trying to say here is that it's um, sort of all related, right? So so for example, the accessibility I think is uh, connected to base layer neutrality. The more neutral a base layer is, the more equally accessible it is for everyone, right? And then also, I think privacy is pretty re um, related to regulation because there's a natural sort of um, anti uh, sort of fight between these two. Yeah? And this is actually what I want to zoom in on these two pairs of sub issues. So, first on sort of sensible regulation and, and privacy. And just as a, just want to zoom in on these two issues. Again, they're, I think they're related or they, they are kind of in, in, um, in a conflict with each other. And I just want to zoom in into something that can help, right? Um, which, I'm sure you're all familiar with this, is this cool idea from Amin. Um, and also now Amin and Vitalik wrote a paper about it, which is this idea of com um, compliant, uh, essentially a compliant version of Tornado in, in a way, which is a, yeah, it's a ZK scheme which you can use it just like Tornado for on-chain privacy, but you can, more importantly, you can actually um, allow users to associate or disassociate with a certain subset of, act of other depositors. So you can actually prove in a way that you are not co-mingling your funds with a, a terrorist or someone on the OFAC list. Right? Um, and I think this is yeah, just one really good example of where we can build more sustainable market architecture and in this, in this um, case, yeah, combining privacy and regulation. Um, and yeah, again, I think it's, privacy is often, I think, underappreciated because not only is it like a, I think it's kind of like a human right, but <laughs> it's also is really uh, sort of, I think, has a lot of value if, if you think about this world where information is, money. Elon Musk says, information equals money. If, um, if, you're not, if there's no privacy, um, then information can't really be money because then everyone has access to it, right? So privacy is deeply connected to information equals money and deeply connected to actually value and business value, yeah? So and there's one example, right? And then zooming in on the other example, which is sort of what we're working on at Shutter, is um, this duality between baseline neutrality and accessibility. Um, and and the, the thing that we are doing is we're encrypting the mempool to increase baseline neutrality. And again, we also think it connects to accessibility because having a more neutral playing field in terms of mempool accessibility, we think yeah, improves sort of mempool accessibility. Yeah? Um, so the way we're doing it, we, are, we have this encryption and decryption scheme, a decentralized encryption decryption scheme, which encrypts um, transactions and have them be signed by the by the block producer or the sequencer or the validator wherever we implement it without them knowing what's even in the transactions. So they and no one else can't um, censor or front run based on the content of the transactions. So um, so pretty simple on the on the surface sort of and then we need need this more complex sort of threshold encryption scheme and this decentralized keeper network to Make it safe to enforce the reveal of the transaction and also to yeah, decentralize this encryptor and decryptor role. Because if you had a centralized um, encryptor or decryptor, then again you would introduce you, you wouldn't solve the problem um, at, at this level, right? Um, so and it's, it's this scheme which um, 
built as this encryption decryption scheme, and it can be plugged into other infrastructures, for example, um, L2s or sidechains. And if you do so, uh, if you kind of enhance this protocol, uh, a protocol, with the server encrypted mempool, we think the benefits for users are because um, it essentially then results in a, a quasi-random ordering with, um, that still includes arbitrage, so we can prevent front-running, still have sort of the majority of the arbitrage um, and liquidations. And we think this is the best outcome to, or the best, best situation leading to sort of the, the highest kind of amount of inc um, information symmetry, and that allows safer trading, right? You're not getting front-run. Uh, in the result, in the consequence of this, also more profitable trading because your prices are better, um, and we're adding this sort of real-time censorship resistance because, yeah, if you uh, don't see what the, it's in transactions, you can't censor um, what's based on the contents. Uh, yeah, and overall, just a more neutral um, and based entity sort of. However, we think there's actually going to be a bunch of upsides as well. So. Um, a, you can still um, collect and distribute the back-running rails MEV, so you're just not going to be front-running, but you're actually still retaining the, um, the ability to ex extract this other type of MEV. Um, and we think sort of by having a better, more fair, more neutral base layer, I think it's going to be an increase. You're increasing the attractiveness of the whole protocol and every, all, all the apps on top. Overall, we think it actually could actually even like increase your income, especially in terms of transaction fees, but even maybe also in the other type, the, the back running related MEV. Yeah, because you're actually then, because right now it's really unsustainable, you can't really trade on it. If you're actually making it like viable for normal people to trade, it could actually even increase your, your, um, your revenue streams. Um, and then there's this a little more complicated argument around um, do you actually as a sort of regular, or as someone who's operating, let's say in, in the West somewhere where they are under sort of regulatory scrutiny, do you actually want to have this outside power to to censor or front run or meddle with the transactions, um, or or not? Yeah, because the regulator is looking at this and they're looking at your ability. What can you actually influence? What, what's your power over this this network? And um, if you're just a neutral technical provider, then it should be fine. Um, but the more it looks like you're actually sort of extracting financial value from front-running your users, <laughs> the le less, uh, less favorable the, is the regulator going to look upon you and might actually want to regulate you as a type of more like a financial intermediary, like a bank or like an MTF. Um, and we're seeing the regulators actually moving in this. Actually. We're seeing them have making these comments about, uh, or not just comments, actually like draft regulation about banning front-running or even... Um, uh, yeah, certain so Nimica regulation and some other reg bank for international settlements as well made these statements um, in this direction that will also maybe ban front running in crypto just like they are banning it in the traditional finance world. Um, the concrete sort of that kind of our, mo our most um, advanced implementation of this is uh, together with the Gnosis chain, um, and this is sort of this collaborative effort where we, yeah, we implement, we're on the path of implementing it into the Gnosis chain. We call it Shutterized Beacon Chain. Could also be this sort of model for even the ETH L1. Um, and um, we have this kind of practical roadmap towards it where we build it as an opt-in version initially. And then again, can serve as a reference implementation for other L1s or L2s. Um, and yeah, um, this is how it looks like. I won't really go into sort of too many technical details, but this is the high-level architecture. There's um, sort of the sequencer contract transactions are, are going in the sequencer contract while they're still encrypted, and this defines them as being final, and the, or it defines them as being in this order, and sort of that, that the proposer has to actually then accept this, no matter what's in the transactions, and only then do the keepers release the decryption key which then executes transactions and again, yeah, ensures the properties that we that we talked about before. Um, briefly, why are we using this threshold encryption approach and maybe not something like a some other approach? So we think, briefly speaking, threshold encryption is really the best of uh, be the best compromise between decentralization, um, security, and technical feasibility. So you can use a sort of hardware-based approach. Like, um, trusted execution environments um, like SGX, 
or you could in the future maybe use these super advanced technologies like fully morphic encryption or advan more advanced forms of MPC. But um, we think the hardware trust assumption, the one case, make it un unviable, and we think the, 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 the level of technological breakthroughs we would actually need to make FHE um, practical and cost effective, we think again, make it, make it that that's not really um, viable right now. Eh? Um, so yeah, to conclude, um, I think yeah, this is just an idea to say to help kind of the, the crypto space by saying we, we should actually maybe we could maybe rally around and start a discussion around what should we change and make, to make the market architecture more more sustainable. Again, similarly to how they did it or how they thought about it after the after the financial crisis in 08. Um, I think it's going to be important to like. Not just have this be a broad, this word sustainability is very broad and, 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 and non-descriptive word. So I think it's going to be important to draw the, con draw the connection between the, the bigger words and the, the more concrete implementations. And, and, and yeah, and all, of, all this I think is quite boring, right? It's just like the, the architecture part and this sustainability sounds all boring, and I think it is boring in a way. <laughs> so I think the next step would be then to build interesting products on top. Um, but yeah, again, I, I think it's actually good to have a boring architecture, a boring infrastructure, because um, we don't want to have ex excitement and problems on, on that level, right? Um, so yeah, and then um, other sort of action item would be if you are building a sidechain or L2 or a front-running sort of prone DAP, um, anything with DeFi, right? Um, would love to get in touch and hear your sort of demands or, or um, uh, your requirements for this. Um, um, or, yeah, again, a two or a side building in a two or side chain would be awesome to talk and whether the encrypted mempool could be an addition, um, uh, a differentiator as well for that protocol. Um, and, yeah, follow us on Twitter. And, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Lewis. That was very insightful. Um, yeah, we still have some time for questions. Uh, so if you have any questions for Lewis, uh, please raise your hands. OK, well, I think that calls it. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to Lewis on the ground floor. Um, so yeah, we still have some time for the next speaker, roughly around eight minutes. Uh, so we'll be back and hope to see you soon.
Okay, hey everybody. So, we've reached our final, final talk at Studio A. Can't believe it. Um, so, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Shemnem Rusitska from Unigy, and she'll be talking about solar assets on chain, what we need to make it there. So everyone, give a warm welcome to Shebnem Zitschka. Thank you. That was perfect pronunciation of my first name. And next year, Ruzitschka will be also perfect. I keep it until then. <laughs> so um, I am Shebnem, and today I will tell you a bit of a brief history of energy and blockchain as well. Um, I want to get into this whole real-world assets, ReFi. If you've been into DeFi, uh, then you definitely know uh, what those mean. And I want to help you to locate solar assets in, on that spectrum. Uh, I will get into adoption barriers. I mean, you heard Louise before. <laughs> We're not there yet, uh, and the crypto innovators need to innovate a bit more. But I would say uh, definitely we know now applicable DeFi primitives. They've been tried and tested by the very brave in the wild, wild west of Web3. Um, and those are definitely also applicable to solar assets, you will see. It's, a, it's almost a no-brainer, but uh, there are adoption barriers, obviously. And there are trailblazers. And interestingly, most of them are clustering around the Gnosis uh, chain ecosystem. And I do believe we are, I'm very optimistic, 80% there. <laughs> Okay, and I want to show uh, what we need uh, and, and have a call for collaboration, call for action, for participation, active participation, to bring those solar assets on chain so that a self-sovereign solar fund can emerge. Good. Now, I have to, you know, uh, brace myself, or you have to brace yourself, <laughs> and I have to uh, stop myself into going into too much detail, but it's also a retrospective of the past seven years. I went into uh, crypto or blockchain and energy because in 2016 there were already energy applications visible through Ethereum uh, and smart contracts, and I only got into blockchain because of those energy applications. So just for reference, um, by the time when Satoshi published uh, the Bitcoin paper, uh, an electronic peer-to-peer -peer cash system, I published actually with colleagues at Siemens a paper on peer-to-peer -peer energy sharing using peer-to-peer um, -peer technologies and smart metering. So that's how much I am into peer-to-peer -peer and energy. But crypto was a game changer, and it came from you know, the, the periphery. And you feel this, that it's a real game changer and people have difficulties to really grasp what is the game changer. Anyways, now just, I try to make it brief. Um, as you see, already in 2014, we had SolarCon, which was conceived as a loyalty program, one SLR for one megawatt hour. It was based on, the, on a Bitcoin, Fork, but with a proof of stake of time, uh, adoption of the consensus mechanisms, because it doesn't make sense to put, uh, well, energy, digital assets on chain on a chain that actually, you know, uses up all that <laughs> benefits at once. Anyways, now there, for example, on the en energy web chain um, that came years and years later. When I went into the space in 2016, 2017, Grid Plus and Power Ledger had their fantastic ICOs just a month uh, apart. I don't know if any one of you have participated in those token sales and uh, the networks. None? 
Okay. Well, anyways, Grid Plus had to do a pivot. <laughs> they realized um, just going after peer-to-peer -peer wholesale and disrupting an entire industry that is as old as uh, you can anything think of, like hundreds of uh, years established and critical infrastructure. You don't just come around and disrupt it. So they made a pivot into this hardware wallet company. And let's see what will come out of that. Power, uh, the token of Power Ledger is still trading, but not for the originally conceived, idealized uh, reasons. And you might know it from the recent uh, SEC case against Coinbase. It was one of the uh, tokens deemed securities on that, on that list. So um, again, I'm a researcher, and I'm always very skeptical. <laughs> Um, I definitely see, like, we, we see the benefits, um, the idealized benefits of this technology, and especially in clean energy access where there is liter literally nothing to disrupt. These techs could make a real difference. So one year after having left Siemens, I went into working uh, on the Sun Protocol with the Africa Green Tech um, uh, startup or scale-up back then. And that was purely for funding the solar uh, tainers um, to bring clean energy access. And back then, you have to imagine these assets. The issue with, uh, with that was the assets are being deployed in um, difficult regions, think war. And a token cannot do anything with that or help uh, remedy any of that risk. And back then, we didn't have decentralized exchanges. We didn't have any notable risk management on protocols. So um, you know, approaching that, we saw the dead end, uh, in a sense, uh, that you have to be able to diversify those risks. Um, at the same time, WePower had uh, actually a nice ICO with the concept that could have worked, namely um, a marketplace for trading, buying, selling, and trading um, um, power purchase agreements. Now, I want to keep that in mind. They raised, I think, 40 million, but just in the second crypto winter, they didn't make it. So since last year, they're not around as is. Um, and we'll get into that, how you could burn through 40 million in four years. Um, Energy Web Foundation is still around. They um, you know, built this since 2016, 2017. They uh, issued um, in 2019 their token, which is a native token to proof of authority uh, chain, Energy Web chain. What's wrong with that? <laughs> um, Number one, it's working, right? But I personally believe there is an issue of incentive misalignment if um, Energy Web Foundation exists to bring decentralized energy to reality. But all of the, or most of the members of that foundation are actually big oil companies like Shell or centralized grid operators. So there is this obvious clash. And just 40 validators or authorities is not really decentralization. <clears throat> well, anyways, and the last point um, uh, where we went into around that time was actually seeing that uh, this whole pooling, um, AMMs, smart pools um, concept in the balancer ecosystem back then, for example, could actually be used to pool solar projects in developing countries with solar projects in developed regions to de-risk and maximize the social and environmental impact of the whole pool. So that was Electricity, <laughs> where I went into around that time. And um, we kept developing, but it was so early that the smart uh, contract developers even had difficulties to grasp what is it, and then apply it to solar power. So we did need all that excitement, hype, and experimentation of DeFi summer. Good. And maybe I won't even go into Klima DAO. <laughs> 
But just to say that um, also the environmental value of these solar assets, namely that you're replacing fossil fuel power with solar power directly, and you can't account for that, that is an asset. And Klima Dao basically created a protocol for um, yeah, issuing a carbon-backed coin, which is a nice concept. The problem was that the um, carbon credits they used were actually junk. And the issue is they were junk in the real world. So crypto, once again, just showed what's faulty in the existing system, but got uh, the full credit for it. Um, of course, as with every innovation, and there were many other issues, or are many other issues, but the concept itself is really interesting. And around that time, also, Unigy uh, approached me, uh, Pedro, um, the CEO, and said, all of these things that you've been developing are they happening for, for real? And we went into it, we developed. Uh, we definitely showed that you can tokenize that environmental value as well, alongside the revenue shares. However, again, <laughs> I will get into that, why that's a problem. But before we get into the problems, please, you know, watch this. Uh, yeah, the site. OK, so every time I take a flight, I take a picture of these unused roof spaces. And I say, you know, one of us has a choice. Air flights, fossil fuel is going to be stay like that for the foreseeable future. But those uh, commercial and industrial rooftops actually should have solar on them because it's a lucrative choice. So this. Um, commercial and industrial actors could uh, save off of their electricity bills 40 to 60 percent, and at the same time also reduce their uh, CO2 emissions and of the whole economy by 60 to 80 percent by not using the dirty grid power. <laughs> and that's where you hopefully see <laughs> how the real-world asset value is there and that we can also tokenize the, what we call regenerative finance or the environmental and social aspects value of these uh, solar assets. Um, the real world aspect is pretty straightforward. We have the revenue shares uh, from sale of solar, and those are long-term contracts, the PPAs. So that is an asset or a value stability that is pretty scarce in the volatile crypto market um, and pretty scarce anywhere else for that matter. These contracts are inflation adjusted, so you have these revenue shares for the next 10, 15 years that you can tokenize and share and use for revenue-based financing. On the regenerative finance side, um, we have the environmental value of directly replacing kilowatt hour for kilowatt hour with clean solar and replacing and displacing the um, uh, energy mix that is mostly, for example, coal still in Germany. So, um, and ReFi um, can take that environmental value as well as the social value, but the other aspect is once you tokenize that, you monetize it and you use it for regeneration, meaning you reinvest that into more solar, replacing more fossil uh, fuel power sources. If that was so easy, why didn't we power make it, right? So it comes down to this old wisdom, timing and talent. And in 2000, or you've heard all of the issues uh, that we still have today. And in 2018, it was really bad timing. <laughs> We needed all those years, and we're still not there when it comes to regulatory issues. And if you think financial regulations is a nightmare, you don't want to meet the energy regulatory <laughs> regions. So um, you, your assets are rooted in those jurisdictions. So we need to really come uh, and create a solution that is globally and easily adaptable. And then. We have uh, two other issues that are really big 
anywhere, even or especially in the developed regions, skilled labor shortage, and then the basic, very obvious coordination failures between many uh, parties that have business transactions with each other. Now, all of these issues can be remedied with education and with making technology accessible that they can really transact in a peer-to-peer -peer manner. If I'm an individual participant or if I'm a business-to-business -business, uh, transacting party. Now, um, this is an overview, okay? And it was so much more complex just half a year ago. Because half a year ago, I had to explain how people need to, you know, uh, get die, get on the bridge, get X die to get on Gnosis chain where the contracts are deployed and actually participate. Uh, however, already within the last uh, couple of months, so many, um, again, trailblazers entered the market or offer their solutions that we can now use. And all of a sudden, I can show that you know, the solar asset managers are going to do their business as usual. They do the financial and technical due diligence of those clients and coordinate installers. And all of those assets are organized in an SPV, a special purpose vehicle or entity that is just founded for that matter. Now, those um, asset managers, when they participate in an association that makes uh, these uh, smart contracts and the interaction with them available to all stakeholders that need to coordinate, they can then um, offer these projects for participation, and anyone with an account on blockchain can participate in a, um, in a self-sovereign manner. So that participation smart contract um, handles you know, how much I participate, how much tokens do I have, and how much of that revenue share I will get along the 10, 15 years of these um, power purchase agreements. And I can claim that uh, Euro E on chain, or I can stake that back into funding more solar. Now, claiming is a taxable <laughs> Uh, taxable event, staking it would keep the value in the network. Uh, however, if I wanted to trade, for example, my participation token, then I can do that on um, any decentralized exchanges, but we would, as a network, need to provide liquidity for those tokens. So these are all the DeFi primitives that have been tried and tested and that we know they work. They just don't work for everyone. <laughs> So these people will be people who are not full-time full crypto traders. And I won't go into more of the details because I don't have time, but if you're interested, uh, definitely happy to share more of those aspects with you, and I will also um, share at the end a link. Um, now, the other aspect, the environmental value, that we also learned you know, uh, in traditional finance or decentralized finance or refi, people want to commodify it and trade it as a commodity. However, these are not commodities, and no one really wants to buy kilograms of CO2 other than traders. But those are not the ones who actually capture or exchange that value. So, um, what we can do as an association, actually, is to um, make that value accessible to brands in the way they can make use of it, which is, at this stage, just digital. They could uh, connect it to their websites or to shopping carts. But that's a service that the association provides for its members and the users of that value, and not something that can or needs to be traded. However, this whole value can be captured in the participation token. If people participate. <laughs> and uh, again, there are trailblazers, especially in the Gnosis ecosystem, uh, who enable participation of mainstream. 
Uh, number one, Monerium. By now, hopefully, everyone <laughs> is a fan, uh, where we can actually have IBANs to our accounts. And that's good for individual participants and especially for the solar asset managers, because we need those IBANs to really have no intermediation and no convoluted how-tos to transact the revenue share. Then we have SAFE, um, right, with they're integrating all these on-ramps like Monerium and also social login, email login that will help so much on both sides again because we need those solar asset managers actually do their business and not, you know, jump through hoops which they're not going to do. And for the self-sovereign solar fund to emerge, we really need decentralized participation. So for that, for example, um, we see features for mainstream usage of decentralized exchanges in call protocol and call swap. We need more of those um, usability features, especially also for liquidity provision. If these things become actions where you need sophisticated strategies, we're not going to have self-sovereign participation at scale. We're going to have a better trading system. And on the other side, <coughs> facing the real world, again, there are so many uh, trailblazers. Um, Google Pay with the credit cards that could be easily, you know, receive the solar cash back from the credits that have been integrated in the shopping experience of these products that have been generated, uh, produced using clean energy. The invoicing part is super important, and one interesting thing that just happened, I don't know if you heard about it, but Hopper actually uh, succeeded in uh, having the Swiss trade register accept the multisig wallet and account and the money on it um, instead of a bank account. Now, this is an amazing time lapse for actually creating those SPVs, right? Because, for example, now we're waiting weeks, up to eight weeks, to actually get a bank account for these commercial uh, solar pools that need a legal entity. Good. 80%. And as you know, the last mile is always the toughest, but definitely it will pay off to stay connected. I just for myself, also need to accept that there will be many worlds. And we need to create those associations in which the, you know, value creators in the real world actually can come and learn about how to use these new trans means and mechanisms of transactions and how to actually participate in a self-sovereign manner. So if you want, um, take your QR shot and then you will be part of this evolving explanation and, and sharing of what that association needs to enable so we can actually democratize access to solar investments. With that, thank you very much. And I don't know if we have time for questions. Or if you... Thank you so much, Shebnam, to wrap up the conference at Studio A. Um, yes, yeah, we still, I believe, have some time for questions, so please raise your hands if you have any questions for Shabnam. No questions. Well, I guess that's it then. Um, if, well, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to um, speak to Shabnam on the ground floor. Um, yeah, thank, thank you again, you. Shabnam. Thank you thank for you. having I guess that uh, wraps it up for Studio A at DAPCON. Uh, we still have a closing speech at 6.05 on the consensus layer, so uh, feel free to check it out. Um, we also have an after party um, at 9 o'clock at Prince Charles, so if you want to get turned up, uh, feel free to check it out. Thank you, and we hope to see you again next year.